Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face episode 84. Today we are going to do a victory lap with Mario Kart 8. And we're going to talk about Telltale's new game, taking on Guardians of the Galaxy. And rumors are flying about an SNES, SNES, Super Nintendo Mini. We're going to talk about it. Let's get going! What's up, everyone? I hope you're all having a great Friday afternoon. Hope you're ready for a great weekend as well. It's Game Face 84 on Sifted Games, ready to rock your world with the biggest news in games for the week. And with that, I would say it has not been a huge week for news no, in the game lot, industry. No. We finally got a bit of a lull in the release schedule. I'm still trying to finish Persona 5. It is undoubtedly the biggest single-player game I've ever played, without a doubt. Um, and this week is kind of a little bit of a lull, and I kind of saw it coming. I was hoping that I would be able to take this week and next week to kind of catch up on some stuff that I had kind of left behind. No. But Persona has completely dashed all hopes of that. So, uh... The good news is, the Switch has another game, Matt. Another game? Yes, believe it or not. Amazing. <laughs> Although I am actually thinking about picking up, what was that, uh, that like $5 like kind of action RPG that just got announced for American release? Comico? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about getting that. Yeah, it looks interesting, mm -hmm. but I feel like when you're starting to look at games like that, you've kind of reached that desperation place. Oh, I don't really care about Mario Kart, so that's kind yeah. of, it's like, that doesn't do anything for me, so maybe I'll get the $5 RPG. Well, it's encouraging to hear that you don't care about the topic we're about to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it is good because you'll sort of be the, the counterpoint to a lot of the things I'm going to talk about about the game. Um, and truth be told, there's not a lot to talk about with Mario Kart 8 because a lot of people, most people, most Nintendo fans, have played mm -hmm. Mario Kart 8 already on the Wii U. Uh, now we're getting, you definitely cannot call this a remaster by any stretch of the imagination. I personally, by looking at the two versions, I cannot see a difference at all. Uh, yeah. Digital Foundry did a feature on it this week, and, you know, they dig deep. And the one thing that they did manage to find was that on the Switch version of Mario Kart 8, the ground textures are clearer about <laughs> an extra 10 feet out from the cart. All right, well. And if Digital Foundry can't find anything else other than that, there's nothing there, so that's, that's that's 300 bucks plus a 60 dollar game, right? Right, yeah. And I think that's kind of what we want to discuss today with Mario Kart 8, because again, a lot of people have played it and kind of get it. And the question is, when you do a game like this, is it right to charge full price for it? I don't know. I, I guess the the idea behind it is kind of that, like, um, you know, the Wii U wasn't exactly setting the world on fire, so theoretically, a lot of people have not played this game. Um, but I feel like most of the people that own a Switch right now probably have played the game. I feel like you're still in the enthusiast stage of the Switch. Um, this is probably more of a setting the table move so that they have it there for uh, the holiday season. Uh, maybe for bundle, you know, the bundle that apparently seems to only be in Russia right now. Yeah, yeah isn't that odd? <laughs> um, I have a feeling we're probably going to see that closer to you know, Thanksgiving holiday shopping season uh, in the West. Um, I just think they want, you know, these, you know, this game is, is going to be here to provide a, you know, filler. A, it's filler, but it's also a favorite, you know, it's like people, it's a game people like, and people would see, you know, maybe don't, haven't had a Nintendo console for a while. They look around at what's out for the Switch when they're considering it. They're like, oh, Mario Kart. We had a good time with Mario Kart back in the day. Maybe we can play Mario Kart. Yeah, so, so I get where they're coming from. It's not a particularly exciting release if you've uh, been keeping up with Nintendo's releases through the last generation. And back to kind of my question, though, is is it right to charge full price for this? Because typically in any business that manufactures something, you take the cost of production, slide in your profit mm -hmm. margin, there's the, rec the suggested retail price. I mean, the cost to develop this game is minimal. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's added stuff, but it's not a revolution. And well, just for so, some like of you or, don't know, basically the difference between Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for Switch and Mario Kart 8 for Wii U is that you get a battle mode mm -hmm. and you get all the DLC that was included and literally a handful of new it's like a couple characters, characters, couple couple race tracks. Yeah, like the Splatoon folks are in yeah. there, um, and you get all even the Mercedes DLC. I was surprised made it to mm -hmm. uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe because you figure that would be. Some kind of an yeah. agreement that would expire eventually. 
uh, but it's made it over. So you're getting the full Mario Kart 8 experience, battle mode, and a couple extra carts for the same price that you paid for something three years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's right that they're going to charge full price for this? No, but I do think it's Nintendo. Do you think it would I didn't been... expect any difference. Right, I did not, me either. But do you think it would have been smarter to put this out for $40? Because then maybe you entice the people who already bought and played it on Wii U to buy it again. Well, from what I've seen... Is it for the greater good, would that be smarter? From what I've seen, uh, they're plenty enticed already. Yeah. If, they own a, if someone owns a Switch, they're pretty excited for this game. Um, don't ask me why. I guess yeah. because it's Mario Kart. Um, but I have certainly not seen much discussion about this game that's centered around the idea of, oh, I don't want to pay full price for this. Basically, it's like, oh my god, I'm going to buy this game and play it on the road because that's totally what you want to play on a, on a fucking bus. Make me barf. Um, <laughs> but, like... I cannot so, I mean, do mean, stuff while I, I drive. Do, would I prefer to pay less for it? Sure. Do I think they need to do that to get the people who own Switches right now to buy it? No, I don't think they do. And I think maybe they're, you know, maybe that's, again, part of the plan. You drop this to closer to 40 bucks, make it a, a pack-in, you know, this holiday season, it becomes a nice incentive rather than, you know, a double charge, which I is mean, what it feels it like a, right now. I mean, taking it a bit further, should it have been a pack-in with the Switch? Probably. I mean, wouldn't that even be the well, look, better one, idea? One to switch should have been the pack in because no one should pay money for that. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> if you want wanted like you know, if you wanted like a Wii style bundle, if you wanted like a game gamer bundle, like this seems like a pretty natural fit. But I guess it wasn't ready yet. I don't know. I don't know why this wouldn't have been ready yet. I think it was probably ready. Yeah, so they're just trying to space it out to make the the the, the weight between. Zelda and Mario feel less like a desert. Or, or the way between this and Splatoon 2 or ARMS. I guess ARMS, They've is, got one, Arms is the next game. But. I hesitate to say major, but they do have a, 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 a highlighted release each month kind of going up to just through September, it seems. So. Yeah. Well, I started playing Deluxe, and I got, I don't know, about halfway through the 100cc and was... I was just like, why? Why am I doing, <laughs> why am I doing this again? Like, I... I you know, obviously multiplayer is evergreen. You're mm -hmm. always going to enjoy playing it with others. Right, as long as you have um, 200 some bucks to spend on Joy-Cons or something. Right. Well, I'm, I'm saying, like, even going back and playing the old Wii U version. Yeah. It's like, that's still there. The multiplayer isn't going away, at least not yet. Although that might be a tactic Nintendo uses to try to convince people to up, up quote, up, quote, unquote, upgrade to the Switch version. Mm -hmm. But it's there. And, you know, battle mode... Battle mode on Mario Kart 64 is some of the best times I've ever had playing video games, period. Um, but I think over time... That was the, bullshit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think over time, but Baby that's Mario, Mario Kart, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's... But that, that allure for battle mode has kind of been diminished a little bit or diluted a little bit because every kart racer that's come since then has had battle mode. Mm. So it hasn't. it's not really a unique feature that... You although the, although get... the Wii U version did get uh, uh, dinged a bit for having this sort of a weak battle mode, which yeah. seems to have been addressed in this one. For sure. Uh, I mean, look, there's no doubt in my mind that Deluxe is the superior version of Mario Kart 8. No mm -hmm. doubt. But as someone, I'm thinking right now, what percentage of people that own a Switch right now do you think owned a Wii U? I'm going to say like 80, 90 percent. You think so? I think that most of the people that have bought a Switch are like Nintendo devotees who also own a Wii U and are getting in on the ground floor for their favorite company's new system. I think it might be lower than that. I think the Switch has an allure that the Wii U never had. And I think some new people may if, have jumped in because... Look, if they do, it's because of Zelda and right. because of the system. Right, and that's what but I'm I saying. But I still think it's pretty damn high. I think there were there was a pretty large contingent of people. And I mean, if you look at... Nintendo's typical fan base and what it ended up selling on Wii U, there's kind of a two or three million person people that are MIA who probably should have bought a Wii U and did it. And I think a lot of those people were waiting for Zelda that never came. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe at least some of those people have kind of jumped in on the Switch now that there's a, a great Zelda game available for it. So I don't think it's 80. I would I honestly think like 65, maybe 60%. Of Switch owners had a Wii U? I think it's way higher than that. Really? Like just because of the price of the system. Like, to spend that 300 bucks, you have to be a Super Zelda devotee. And I think 
those Super Zelda devotees probably found enough interest in HD versions of Wind Waker and Twilight Princess to get a cheap Wii U, which is pretty much what I did. Yeah. Um, because I, Zelda's, you know, Zelda and Metroid are my top tier Nintendo franchises, which means I don't have a reason to buy a Nintendo system all that often right, anymore. Right. But you know, having uh, basic, I mean, look. One of the reasons I wanted the uh, you know the Wii U was because I knew Twilight Princess HD was coming, and I wanted a version of that I could play without the waggle, um, and I didn't want to pay a hundred bucks for the GameCube version. So uh, so that you know that, that did bring me in. It could also ultimately end up being the most collectible Nintendo console of all time. It's true because it sold the worst. So if you talk about supply and demand, twenty mm-hmm. thirty years on down the road, when Collectors are collecting something that's mm-hmm. an antique now. Well, the other thing I think is uh, the gamepad is going to be an issue there because we don't know how long those are going to hold up, and eventually, eventually, it's going to be like people are going to be searching for replacement gamepads, which yeah. means the number of gamepads out there in the secondary collectors market years from now is going to be much lower than the number of actual system You're units. Right. Yeah. So, I think the big thing is going to be. Game like in like 10, 15 years from now, among Nintendo collectors, is going to be finding working game pads. That could be. Um, in fact, I've actually considered buying a second game pad from Nintendo because Nintendo still sells them like you know direct on the website. I've thought about buying a backup yeah. just in case down the road I need one. I think or, they're close to like a hundred bucks though. Yeah, they're pricey. I mean, they, they, those things are only are only ever going to be so cheap to produce because of the nature of the touchscreen. But well, you uh, figure 20, 30 years from now, that thing will probably be worth. Like yeah. five, six hundred bucks. I mean, if you're a big Wii U fan, um, and they they do exist, yeah. um, I would definitely, even if it's like second hand, I would definitely try to get a, a backup gamepad before the, the secondary market catches up to it, because I think that's going to be your sought after like hardware collectible for that for that system. Or if you just have a complete system, period. Right. Yeah. Right. But I, but I take think, care of your Wii U people. Yeah. Like when you put it away, make sure you put it all back in its original wrapping. Don't stack a bunch of heavy stuff on top of it. Yeah, take care with that gamepad, because that's going to be your, your lifeline, the hard thing to find in the future. Yeah. Um, I still think that the number is lower. And, and anecdotally speaking, there's been a lot of people on Sifted who did not have a Wii U who I've seen on the site say that they've got themselves a Switch. Uh, again, that's anecdotal evidence, which very rarely is accurate. Um, but it just seems like there's a bigger buzz for Switch than there was for Wii U. And therefore, a lot of people who may not have had that other system will jump on board with this one. What are you laughing at? I'm laughing at the, the, the chat, because mainly because of a, a typo. But uh, Wolf, Wolf Ox 10 jc says, Honestly, Nintendo should stop honey-dicking us with Minx and give us the vir- damn virtual console already. And he meant minis. Right. But honey-dicking <laughs> us with Minx should mean something. Yeah. Like that's... We gotta, we gotta make that mean something. That, At that's first, a when you said that, adopt. I thought it was like some obscure Nintendo character that I had never heard of before. I was like, "Who's Minx?" I'm like, "What game was he or she in?" I don't remember. Um, you know, honey, we gotta come up with a meaning for honey dickiness with Minx. <laughs> that's, a, that's the next sifted T-shirt right there. <laughs> make the shirt Ooh, honey boy. colored or whatever. Um, but. So I guess my final take really on Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is if you did not own a Wii U, buy it immediately. It is the best, probably the best If you can find one, they're basically gone at retail. You can get a refurbished one uh, from Nintendo directly, but uh, they're they're, they're basically not available. Oh, wait, you're talking about Wii U's? Wii U's. No, I'm talking about the Switch version. Like, if you never owned a Wii U, you should buy Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Oh, okay, buy Mario Kart. You said one. I I thought you meant, yeah, the system. (laughs) I mean, I could argue that it's probably the best kart racing game ever made. Um, as, as much as my love for Mario Kart 64 goes to the very core of my being, uh, this is a superior game. And you have the online connectivity. It's certainly much better than the Mario Kart that was released for the Wii. Um, but if you already own it, I, I know some people may only have a Switch, or maybe they only have a Switch and a Wii U, and they're getting at that desperation point. They've milked everything they can out of Zelda at this point, and they just want a game to play on it. Man, if you still have that Wii U sitting around, just... (laughs) I mean, the other thing, too, is that you're going to find a lot more people probably still to play against Mm. on Wii U online because of the install base. And this game sold like crazy on Wii U. And a part of that, one, it's because it's a great game, but two, it's because just like with the Switch, there wasn't a lot of software for it. So, you know, the, the install base for this game on Wii U is huge. And I guarantee even this long after its release, there's still probably more people to square off against online than there are on the Switch version. Now, that'll... 
there's a curve there where that'll change over the next year and a half or two years. The other part of it, too, is that Nintendo's making Mario Kart 9. There's no way it's not. Um, that's, what, again, why I found this re-release kind of curious. Is like, is that just keeping you from getting the new one done? It's, pro- it's probably a ways out, I would think, a couple years out. Well, I mean, typically, Mario Kart launches in the second year mm-hmm. of, of a Nintendo console. So, I guess it may- that adds up, actually. You finish this now, you got two years to get the new one done. Um, but... If you've if you've already played this on Wii U and spent a ton of time with it like I did, literally I probably played this game for like 150, 200 hours all told between the part I played for review and then the online that I played following that. I, I got a lot out of this game and I, that's why it's not enticing for me to play it again and why I kind of stopped playing it, um, playing through the campaign at least, because I was just like, man, I played the living Christ. And this isn't a game that you just play like once Mm-hmm. And then you're done. And then a few years later, you forget everything that you did in it. When I started playing this, I remembered where all the shortcuts were. I remember where all the parts of the tracks were, where you could really make a move and like move up. Like, I just wasn't getting anything out. I was going through the motions. I was a robot replicating what I had done before. I guess if you're like a battle mode devotee, it yeah. might be worth it. I guess. Because um, that does look substantially improved. Oh, it's like night and day. Um but no block fort, no deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, Mario Kart 64, there were, I think, four maps for yeah. Battle Mode. I only, we only ever played block fort. Yeah, I think block fort was the only thing we ever played. We never played any other map. And it, I don't know why Nintendo has it insisted on that map being in every Battle Mode ever after that. I, Nintendo I don't know. doesn't want to give you what you want. They want to tell you what you want. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, but if you have this already for Wii U... I, like I was saying earlier, I could see spending forty dollars on it because it, it's third of the or two thirds of the cost of it was before. Yeah, it's a familiar experience, but it does kind of have that extra content that you can get into. Yeah, maybe like trade in your Wii U version. And... Yeah, that's actually a good idea. Trade in your Wii U version, sell it on eBay or something like that. Get your twenty bucks for it, and then put that towards getting mm-hmm. the upgrade. That's a really good idea, actually. That is what I would recommend. Doing exactly what Matt said. Um, if you've never played this before, go buy it right now. Without a doubt, no questions. I have no fear that anyone will come back at me and say, I hate you for telling me to buy Mario Kart 8. It is not going to happen. It is a great kart racer. It was, it still is, and it will be 20 years from now. It's like, we still play like Super Mario Kart and like it. So I think in 20 years, this game is still going to hold up thanks to Nintendo's sort of cartoony art style. So that's my take on uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch. I realize a lot of you guys are maybe in desperation mode right now. If you own a Switch, you finish up Zelda and you don't have a lot to play after that. But uh, I would proceed with caution. Uh, Let's move on. We're going to talk next about another old game, but one that is far older than Mario Kart 8. We're going to talk about Full Throttle Remastered, a classic point-and-click from Tim Schafer at Mm. Double Fine, although created before Double Fine existed. Yeah. Um, Matt, you've been playing it. You're mm-hmm. you've been playing a lot of point and clicks over the last yeah six it's, eight uh, months. It's uh, certainly a renaissance. Yeah. I haven't gotten around to Siberia three yet. But, yeah, uh, what well, just came out today? I think. Uh, no, it came out yesterday. Well, Went yesterday. up a day early for some reason on Steam. Release dates are getting weird. Yeah, a lot of Fridays. A lot know. of Fridays. Like Friday is the new Tuesday with release mm-hmm. dates for Especially whatever reason. PC. Yeah, not even just PC though. Like a lot of. Uh, Multiplayer focused games come mm. out on Fridays now because they want people to, to play through the campaign that first Friday. Right. Because most shooters, you get through the campaign in five or six hours and then dive into the multiplayer for the next two days, get you good and hooked. <laughs> so you keep coming back for more. You go to work on Monday, you're like, oh man, I spent all weekend playing Call of Duty World War II, which, by the way, was confirmed today. Mm-hmm. Call of Duty World War II is real, it is actually happening, uh, debuting next week on Wednesday, I think, at. 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. Hmm. They're going to do a big blowout for the game. Um, I'll, I'll watch the replay, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Not getting up early for Call of Duty. I have to get up early to make sure that it's on the site. But, uh, yeah, so that's being blown out next week. Um, but, anyway, back to Full Throttle. Where would you rank this in the pantheon of Tim Schafer point and clicks? Uh, I would, uh, well, I mean, I rank it, I, it's my second or third favorite LucasArts adventure game. Okay. Um, which is blasphemy to the people who love Maniac Mansion and Day of the Tentacle, but I don't like those games all that much. Um, I do like them, but they're not up. I mean, my favorite LucasArts po- adventure game of all time is The Dig, which is a lot I've of people's... I've never played that. A lot of people's least favorite uh, po- adventure game uh, from LucasArts, because it's not very funny. Yeah. It's not in the same vein as all the others, but it's a, 
it's a fairly straightforward sci-fi adventure that uses a lot of Wagner music and uh, Spielberg was involved with it uh, tangentially and Alan Dean Foster who did the the, um, the novelization of Star Wars back in the 70s and it's a um, it's kind of a sci fantasy ish like alien zap to another world story uh, starring Robert Patrick oh. um, and I would absolutely I would run a man down with a motorcycle to get that as the next remastered game, but I don't know who would do that because Tim Schafer, as far as I know, was not involved in it. Okay. Um, I don't know who would remaster that unless Double Fine decides to just start doing that for all LucasArts adventures, but so far they've only done uh, Tim Schafer stuff. I mean, However, that's, that's a bold statement, what you just said. Like, second or third best LucasArts point. Because like, it flips back and forth with Grim Fandango, depending on how I feel that day. I mean, LucasArts, for people who maybe haven't been a part of the industry as long as us or haven't followed the industry as long as us, LucasArts point and clicks are the... Holy Grail. They were, the, they, they were the gold standards for kind of the '90s era of the. You know, they, they, you had the the text parser uh, adventure games, which were like King's Quest and Space Quest and stuff, and then uh, LucasArts starting with Loom, um, which was you know at the time kind of looked down on by hardcore adventure fans because you couldn't die. Right. Like part of the part of the the, the 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 staples of the genre in the in the 80s and early 90s uh, as done by Sierra and other game other companies that were duplicating what Sierra was doing was you take a step out of line and they kill you horribly i mean you were, there were infinite ways to die and usually they were pretty entertaining uh, until you were just trying you know except for the times when it was like on King's Quest the King's Quest games were like Carefully navigate this very narrow pathway, or you fall off and die, and you have to start over. It's, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a ton of fun for people who were just trying to play. Yeah. And so LucasArts really pioneered the idea of like, yeah, you have to figure out what to do, but we're not going to kill you horribly and make you redo stuff over and over again. And Loom was sort of the beginning of that. Now, most people would hold up, I think, Monkey Island. Right. And, uh, I mean, there are so many. And Day of the Tentacle as sort of the pinnacles, and Grim Fandango gets you know gets a and lot the of Monkey praise. Island sequels. Right. And- but, like, I think, you know, I'm thinking about it and really looking at what I like. Beyond the Dig, which is just sort of my thing, something I, I'm more interested in, um, I, I think I just like Tim Schafer's sense of humor more than Ron Gilbert's. Oh, I can totally uh, understand that, yeah. I, I, Tom, Tim Schafer's stuff just hits me the right way, and I like Monkey Island and Day of the Tentacle and stuff, but it doesn't, it doesn't like, you know, sing to me the way Schafer's stuff does. Um... And this is, I mean, I played Full Throttle on my old Mac Performa right. back in college, like, I mean, 15, 20 times, probably. Once you figure the, these games out, once you get through it and you know what to do, you can finish these things in, like, three, four hours, Right, probably. the replay value on point-and-click adventure games is pretty much yeah. nil. <laughs> nil, unless you really enjoy the story. Right, you want to experience and it again. It's I like would, watching a movie again. Yeah, I would play it, like, you know, it was a, it was a great, uh, like, sun, Saturday, rainy Saturday in the dorm room game. You know, I would just kill an afternoon playing that game. Oh, there's nothing else to do, and I love that. Uh, it, to the point that playing, because you know, this the, the remaster does use the, the same voice tracks, uh, cleaned up a bit. And in fact, there's a if you hit F1, you can switch back to the original graphics, and it actually does change the sound mix back to the old sound mix, and it makes the vocal quality worse. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's ex- it's exactly the game from the '90s. And um, the funny thing is, like, I haven't thought about played this game in probably. 18 years. Right. And like... Well, first, let's, let's set up the plot for everybody. Uh, Tell everybody what it's about. Well, um, you are basically... You play as a, a guy named Ben who is the leader of a, of a biker gang called the Polecats. Um, and he... Uh, the guy who founded Corley Motors, an old man who... I mean, it's basically Harley Davidson. And um, he pulls up to their biker bar in a limousine and... And hangs out with him and uh, his corrupt executive friend, Rip Berger, who's voiced by Mark Hamill, um, wants to take over the company and use it to sell minivans and lay all the American workers off and, and uh, transfer everything overseas and sell it to overseas interests. Still relevant. <laughs> 22 years later. So how funny is it, though, that this, yeah. it wouldn't have been relevant. <laughs> For the last like ten years, and now, mm. right now, it is absolutely relevant. Yeah. So he, so uh, he uh, kills um, Corley, the old, because the, the, the old man Corley is an old biker. Like, he's buddies with Ben. Like he's one of the, he's one of the real ones. And uh-huh. He wants to, you know, build. He wants to build motorcycles for bikers, and he's the last motorcycle maker in the country. And uh, so, so you, and you can see there's old old uh, Bernie Sanders Cor- 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 Corley. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> it's really eerie. It really kept it's striking me. Crazy. Throughout the <laughs> so Rip Burger uh, kills Corley and frames it on Ben. So the game is basically, and Ben the biker Ben's biker gang gets arrested because he's not there, so he slips through. And basically, the game is your plan is Ben trying to unframe your biker gang and bring the the real killers of the last great motorcycle maker in the country to justice. Okay. Part of the now part of the twist here is that it doesn't take place in our world at all. Like like the there's hover vehicles and the bikes have like nitro boosts that like shoot flame out the back and and uh, fertilizer is like this weird powder stuff and like there's there's biker the biker gangs are like there's religious fanatics that are biker gangs called cave fish and they have night vision goggles they let them see the the reflectors in the road and they're otherwise they're blind that's how they na- navigate and they attack tanker trucks and stuff and like it's a weird sort of, I don't want to call it steampunk cuz it's not yeah, but yeah. it's like it's a weird like almost mad maxish with high tech with blade runner tech like setting it and was it's, interesting it's unique. this week uh tim was making the rounds promoting the launch mm. of the game and uh, he sat in on a couple podcasts and did a couple interviews and in one of the interviews he explains where he got the idea for this the story in this game because it's insane yeah. like, well, I'm like, you sit there, like, you're like how did he come up with this it reminds stuff? me of like heavy metal magazine stuff yeah yeah it, you're right that's a good that's a good analogy but he talked about how he ran into an old friend who had just ended up, like, hanging out with a biker gang for, like, six <laughs> months of his life. Like, he was a hitchhiking or something and, like, ended up meeting up with a biker gang. And, like, they took him in and he learned, like, what it was like to be a part of their gang. And then ran into Tim and tells him the story. And then Tim is like, wow, like, <laughs> they need to make it a video game based on it. Which is, you know, that's what geniuses do, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, um, have there been any changes to this? There's, what, and no. how, none at all? Not that I can tell. I mean, it's all identical and to the point that, like... I mean, I haven't thought about this game in a long time, but when scenes in this start, I can say the lines with them. Wow. Like, I remember all of it as soon as it, like, kind of kicks into gear. I was watching um, uh, The Evil Dead 2 the other night doing the same yeah. exact thing. <laughs> and it's amazing. Like, you know, it's, it's like I couldn't have thought of almost many of the lines, of, like, you know, if you had asked me. But uh-huh. as soon as these scenes start, I'm like... The only thing I really remembered was uh, when you come back to this bar later... There's a guy playing cheat the devil with the, uh-huh. with a knife, and one of the, the dialogue options is, "I can do that." And, and, the, <laughs> and the guy goes, "Not gonna happen." <laughs> Let me show you how to do that. Well, I guess not gonna happen. And I would do that for like just minutes to hear at him time. say it. And the funny thing is, I rem- my ha- memories of this in that sense were so hazy that I thought he was in the first scene. Oh, really? I was like, "Where's the knife guy? Uh-oh. He took the knife guy out." And like, no, I just didn't remember he was in. He's there later. I guess one of the challenges with remastering really any game, but particularly games like this, is is you can't really add story to them. No, not really. Because how do you find even if you find the voice actor and he's still alive or she's still alive, their voice has probably changed. Mm-hmm. And I, I will say that I will say the 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 voice quality is very good for something recorded in 1994. I wonder like, what they recorded it on a tape, obviously. Well, it was, well no, it was LucasArts, so probably the same thing they'd record ADR for a movie then. Like, oh, yeah, it's probably the same good, equipment. That's a good point, actually. It's probably the same equipment they would have used for like you know a real movie that Lucas only because made. it was Lucas it was that in made the, the it's game. all the same yeah thing. if this was any other developer I mean, though yeah i mean really you're dealing with skywalker sound yeah. which is was at the cutting edge of the time oh, so yeah. i'm sure they still had the I mean, lucas saves everything so i'm sure they ha- still had the original files yeah. backed up somewhere and they just like took them and used you know basically they probably used the raw recordings cuz that you can do that now instead of compressing them down to 1100 yeah. 11000 um so that sounds really good the main the main added thing obviously is you know, it looks way better. High res um, art, which I'm assuming they drew. I don't know how they did that actually. I don't know how you did, but it, it's real. I mean, the, like the the timing of the animations is exactly the same. You can hit F1, like I said, real time switches back and forth. You can see it's identical, like frame to frame, frame by frame. Yeah. Um, the main uh, other the other main addition is there's uh, developer commentary. Oh. Um, which, you which can, normally doesn't mean squat. No, but with but Tim Schafer, with Tim Schafer guys, it means a lot. Now, if yeah. you've never played it, I recommend not listening to it the first time yeah, through because yeah, they because they talk about it assuming you've played this game before. Yeah. Um, there's, so there's spoilers here and there. Um, but you can turn it on and off with A as, as you go, so you're not locked in one way or the other. Yeah. But again, just you know, just like if you've listened to a podcast with Tim Schafer, listening to Tim Schafer talk about the old days and how they used to do all this stuff and where they, where their ideas came from and 
you know, all the stories from behind the scenes. Like, it's fascinating. You know, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's a really good storyteller. <laughs> Obviously. In and out of yeah. a game. <laughs> um, so what, that's great. What makes that's this great. great, though, Matt? So you're saying it's the second, third best Lucas, mm-hmm. LucasArts point-and-click ever. What is it about this that really sets it apart? Obviously, the story's unique. It's, a, it's unique. It's a straightforward story, but it's also not... It's, it's unlike the others, and it's still funny, but it's not, like, slapstick stupid funny. It's not, yeah. like... You know, it, it, there's there's some like you know attempts at actual uh, drama, I guess, in this, and some of it there's some there's some good moments uh, to it. The characters are well drawn; they feel like real people more than like kind of stand-ins for a punchline, which I thought Monkey Island ended up doing a little yeah. more, more than I liked. Yeah. Um, and it all just kind of fits together well. The one thing I will say is like that you can see here that the a, a biker fight is about to start here, a, a road fight. Uh, these don't control very well. They yeah, never they did. They never did, yeah. Um, but they haven't, you know, like I said, they haven't added anything and they haven't really fixed anything. So uh, this is still uh, rough. Like this, is, like, this is the first fight and then another, like, kind of adventure sequence happens and then you end up on the road and you have to go down the old mine road and fight a whole bunch of different biker guys. That's where I stopped last night because I'm like, well, I don't need this kind of aggravation at 1130. Um, so I'm I'm not saying it's flawless. Uh, that part is still difficult to deal with, and 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 even you know, probably worse now because 22 years later I've lost my patience for the kind of constant repetition. I also I picked up uh, the Cinemaware anthology because I'm reading old video game magazines, and I realized I've never seen an Amiga before. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I should play like these games that I never I drooled over in game magazines and never got to play. Well, you can't go home again. Some, <laughs> look, Rocket Raider's 31 years old, yeah. and it feels it. Yeah. Um, and like, it's just one of those things where it's like, I don't have the patience to deal with you anymore. Whereas when I was 10, apparently I did. Yep. Um, so this game, uh, and on the other thing they added is uh, if you hold, uh, I think it's the shift key down, anything you can interact with on the screen will glow. Um, so that that solves part of the problem of like not knowing which thing you could click on which was not as pronounced in the old games because it was a little easier to tell what objects were interactive objects and what right. objects were part of the background because yeah. the background tended to be uh, a 2D image and the stuff you could interact with was actually separate and on the screen stand out, but yeah. now with in the upgrade everything you know everything looks the same, same which yeah. is an improvement but at the same time is you're gonna you know you kind of gotta play hunt the pixel or you can hold the shift key down. I think it's the shift key. Hold the hold the key down and it just shows you highlights what you can deal with, which uh, doesn't solve the problem. You know, doesn't solve the puzzles for you, but at least points you in the right direction uh, where the pointers used to be kind of attached to the primitive technology. Yeah. Um, this genre is is one that, at least in the modern age, you don't really find fans of this genre there are people who appreciate them from their early days playing games like we do you don't really find hardcore fans so most people maybe they pick up one a year one every two years when they get that itch i think there is a hardcore point and click adventure game fan base yeah Uh, they're just not you know hear about because that tends to be they're not going to watch this show no is my point they they tend to be the only thing they play yeah i'm I'm trying to speak to the people who are watching game face Mm -hmm. and I think I've described them pretty accurately. Most of them, maybe they have respect for it, but maybe they play one a year, maybe one every two years or whatever. Do you recommend them picking up a game like Full Throttle or a game like Siberia 3, which finally came out? Right. Um, I think which has more to, more modern accoutrements than you might find in Full Throttle. Well, I would I would probably recommend this because. Uh... For one thing, is full is standalone. Yeah, uh, you don't have to have played two previous games to understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, the production value is still high, and I think the art style doesn't feel old. No, whereas, it doesn't whereas, at all. Whereas yeah. Siberia Three, while it doesn't look bad, doesn't look this gen exactly. Well, Siberia Three, because it has been so long in development, yeah. does not look good. No, <laughs> I was. It's like, man, you guys took so long that you finally got across the finish line, and now your game looks outdated. Yep. <laughs> That's the danger, obviously, of, of constantly delaying a game. So you would recommend, and let's say Siberia and every other way is at least in the same league as Full Throttle. You would recommend Full Throttle. Yeah, I just find Full Throttle. There's no other game that I can think of that really reminds me of Full Throttle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, <laughs> that's a good point. It's just, you know, maybe if you squint, Road Rash. Yeah, yeah. But that's, like, there's no world building in Road Rash. So, yeah. Um, and it's just kind of a, like a... 
like a good old tale from the road, you yeah. know. It's like, the, it, and it's got that that love for you know, the motorcycle culture and the kind of you know, the the, the southwestern freeway culture that kind of Route sixty six thing a little bit, except yeah. with like a French comic book sci fi twist to it. And it's just you know, and the performances are really good. Uh, I don't know if the guy who voiced Ben ever did anything else, or if he did like pulled like a John Marston and just vanished like that guy did. Yeah. Um, but he's excellent. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, voice acting talent, including Mark Hamill. Um, back before he was, you know, he's kind of doing the Joker voice a little bit, but yeah. with a little more gravel in it. Uh-huh. Uh, but you can tell it's him. Although, he was on his way at that point yeah. to getting to where he was going. I mean, go. at the time it was ninety. It was ninety five. So at the time, I didn't recognize him. I, I, it. It lists Mark Hamill in the credits at the beginning, but um, I had no idea who he was in there until I really listened. How geeked um, out was Tim Schafer whenever he got to bring in Luke oh, Skywalker yeah. to do well, voice Hamill, work? Well, Hamill was doing some like real weird gaming. I mean, he'd just done Wing Commander, right. uh, the, the live-action FMV segments for Wing Commander 3 and 4. Yep. Um, so he was open. To, and also, you know, as we know, Mark Hamill's a nerd. So, yeah. I mean, he's into this stuff. He's, he is, he's, yeah. he's, happy, he's happy to be involved with this stuff. So why not? And... Um, also, it was Lucas. You know, all all, all the it's pieces fall in the, in the place. Yeah. You can, t- you, I would I would have liked to have been there when Tim Schafer's like when the idea bulb went up. It's like, oh wait, yeah. I bet we could get. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. How even, much are they selling this format? Uh, this is um, God. I don't remember because I bought I pre-ordered it like months ago. Um, I think it's fifteen. Might be okay. twenty. I don't remember. Would you buy? It? Would you recommend somebody buy it at either price? No, I mean I bought it for fifty bucks in nineteen ninety five. Right, but that's nineteen ninety five. Yeah, that was twenty two years ago. Um, believe, if you can believe that. Well, the nice thing about point and clicks is like they're kind of this. They don't really age. They don't. You know, yeah. Like your brain is really the the, the game player there. Yeah, either the, you like it or you don't. Yeah, I mean the, the the thing about full throttle up to now is like, well, if you can tolerate the old graphics, and now that's sort of gone. Yeah. Um, and it's also the soundtrack's a lot of fun. It's like this like kind of sort of western rock band called the Gone Jackals. Were they um, a real band? They were a real band. Uh, I don't know if they're still a real band. <laughs> I highly doubt it. At the time, they were a real thing. Yeah. Um, it's 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 like nothing you really have played except this game. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the gameplay is the same as any Scum. Uh, that's the, the name of the, the, the engine that LucasArts used was Scum. Uh, it's the same as any of them like, in terms of, you know, you point the thing, the options come up, you pick the thing, you right-click, the, the, the inventory comes up. Um, there's a lot of, like, funny stuff in it here and there. Uh, I, again, I actually really laughed out loud, like, because it was a line I don't, I didn't remember. I Maybe I never got, but I like, tried to use the meat on a thing, is a hunk of meat, and he just goes, that's not one of meat's many uses. And I just, <laughs> and I just it just killed me for, like, five minutes. I, don't, I was laughing about that for the next two scenes in the game. I don't know why it got me. Yeah. But it's just that kind of thing. That's it's, great it's writing, a, though. That's what great writing does. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, Tim Schafer always has great writing. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'd recommend it just because I, th- I think it's a solid thing that doesn't have a lot of equivalents. And uh, I think performance-wise, it still holds up. Animation-wise, it still holds up. Like, if you didn't know this came out in 1995, you might not know it didn't come out this year for, f- for the first time. Right. Uh, you know, at the very least, I'd say give it a real hard look in the next Steam sale. All right. Let's move on. We're going to talk next about Ancestors. It was a game. It's a game. It is a game from Patrice Dizelay. Who, uh, according to the chat, the guy who voiced Ben has been dead for 15 years. Oh, so. wow. So, no, no new content. Yeah, that's not happening. Unless they can find a stand-in or whatever. Uh, so we're going to talk about Ancestors, a new game from Patrice Dizelay. He is basically the guy who created Assassin's Creed. Yeah, he was definitely the guiding force. He was the, his official title was Creative Director mm-hmm. on the franchise. He basically came up with the idea and the concepts yeah. and like everything. If, like, if you... Um, if Assassin's Creed 3 kind of ruined everything for you, uh, it's because he was gone then. Yeah. Basically. That was, you're right. That was the first game that they kind of handed over mm-hmm. the reins to a new team. And changed the controls. And I will yep. never forgive them for that. Um, Patrice certainly has a great reputation within the industry. He's a great mm-hmm. guy as well. I've met him several times. He's the nicest dude. Completely humble. Um, he's one of those people that you meet... And you're like, oh, he seemed really cool. You never know if he is. And then, like, you walk away and you get a Facebook friend invite from him. Like, mm-hmm. as you, like, literally, if you're, if you're 15 feet away from him and your phone goes ding and you look yep. and he's, that's like the kind of guy he that is. That happened to me with uh, Jordan Mechner. 
Ah. And uh, the guy who made Karataka and Prince yeah, of Persia, yeah. and that was like one of the greatest things ever. Because <laughs> like, I loved those games back in the day, and it was just yeah. like one of, it's like one of those things where it's like one, you know, one of your gaming heroes not only talked to you, but apparently liked you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Patrice was... I don't know if we ever really got the whole story of why he left. It seemed a little bit like he had been forced out. It's um, hard to tell with all that UB drama that happened up there back yeah. around, around that time. But he left the way... The success of Assassin's Creed really seemed to bring up a few jockeying for position situations. Sure. And truth be told, he should have got whatever position he wanted. He's yeah. the shepherd of the franchise. So... You know, after the second game, he just kind of, just one day, he's like, I'm leaving, and I'm going to start working on this new game. In 2014, they announced this game, Ancestors, and really just announced it. And said, hey, I'm making this game about, I don't even know what you say this game is about. I guess prehistoric history, Kinda, yeah. so to speak. Um, and that's all he said. And then in 2015... He did a demo for this game at a little gaming event, and somebody was smart enough to kind of snap it with their cell phone. And up until now, that's all we've had on Sifted for this game, was this little crappy cell phone video that somebody had taken. This week, finally unleashes the full Monty with a trailer, which is what you're watching right now. Um, it takes place in a time period that is between 10 million years ago and 2 million years ago. That's a generous gap. Yeah, <laughs> certainly a lot of leeway in there. Um, information is still kind of dodgy. He didn't put out a lot of information about it. He basically said it's an action adventure, open world action adventure survival game set during the time period we just mentioned. Um, we don't see many video games announced and let alone released ultimately that take place during this time period. And I guess the one exception would be Far Cry Primal, mm -hmm. which ironically is from Ubisoft. Makes you wonder if three years before he left, if he sat in with the Far Cry team and was like, hey, why don't you do like a prehistoric version of this game? Um, Matt, what do you think about games that take place in this time period? And more specifically, games in this genre, an action-adventure survival genre. Um, do you feel like that time period gives you enough tools to fiddle around with to make a game like this interesting over the long haul? We, we kind of asked this question about Primal because we were like, oh, there's not going to be any guns. Mm. And there was a bow in Primal which basically just took over for the gun anyway. And while I did feel like it was missing a little something, it didn't end up being a deal breaker for me with Far Cry Primal. I don't even know if there'll be a bow in this. I mean, if you're talking about 10 million years ago, you're talking about Neanderthals, basically. Mm. They used rocks and clubs. Well, they had, I guess two million years ago. They had somewhat sophisticated things. I mean, the, you know, we, the Neanderthals are more uh, sophisticated than we think. And it may not be about Neanderthals. It may be about uh, Cro-Magnon or, or right. Homo habilis or whatever. I mean, there's a whole... Ten million years is a long, you know, long stretch of time. Right. Up to two million years, like you're talking about, like well, around two million years, we're probably about hitting the point where we're recognizable as Tools you know, homo, homo sapiens sapiens. But like ten million, you're, you're probably looking at a pretty drastic change from ten million to two million in terms of like what you start as versus what you finish as. Um, it's an interesting time period because it's not really something that's been that's explored in detail in most pop culture. Yeah. Um, you know, because basically, if you're going to go back a few million years in most pop culture, you're going to like, ah, what the hell? Go back 65 million years to do dinosaurs. You yeah. Because dinosaurs, everybody loves dinosaurs. Right. Um, these are interesting, though. I mean, you know, these are interesting because you know we forget that like you know our ancestors lived among monsters. Yeah. Among these these you know th this is. Uh, you know, here's Far Cry Primal, but like that, this kind of you know mammoths and saber toothed tigers and giant sloths and all this stuff. That's that's in our you know ancestral DNA. If you, if you want to yeah. if you want to get our ancestral a, data banks. Yeah, if you want to <laughs> get Assassin's Creedy about it, um, and it's interesting to me to think about how recent some of. I mean, you know, uh, the uh, the mammoths. Uh, you know, there were still mammoths around uh, during like ancient. You know, when when Julius Caesar was around, I think, or maybe it was more pyramid era. Yeah. Yeah, was, I don't it think was, it was not not during Caesar. But yeah, like way up north, you had. I mean, they they, they only died out about six thousand years ago. Yeah. Like, and we, you know, the the span of time is 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 fascinating in the it sense. Really but is. also because think about it, uh, to Cleopatra, um, the iPhone was closer in 
time span than the pyramids. Right. Like, building the pyramids. Yeah, to that, people to don't her, realize that. To her, yeah. the pyramids are already as old as she is to us. Right. And like, you know, the, you even go back a little further and you're basically in wild land. You yeah. Know? Go back to two million, you're talking about stuff we really have no... We, we we don't we don't get taught that we don't read a lot about it we don't we don't know a lot about it so if this is a is a thing that he's really done the research and which really, I which will I mean a thousand him, percent yes, guarantee he did, absolutely yeah. this could be really fascinating in terms of like what he how he wants to depict this and how he what the things he wants to portray because I feel like what we're going to be playing here is going to be substantially more primitive than what Far Cry Primal I mean Far Cry oh, yeah. Primal played fast and loose anyway yeah yeah for but sure. like. Far Cry Primal is depicting something that feels a little more like 100,000 years ago, right. which is very different from 2 million years ago. You're talking about, you know, species that would not be considered us. Uh, and and if you've ever seen Walking with Cavemen, uh, or whatever they called that in in uh, the UK, because I know they changed, I think they changed the title. Uh, that happens a lot. Over here, to, to fit the Walking with Dinosaurs thing. There's some fascinating stuff in there. The, the development of of not just tools, but the development of, like, how our ancestors treated death like right. the idea that you know until a certain point you know when a when a when one of the tribe members died they just sort of left him there like there was no instinct to bury them you know it's yeah, not it's like, like he's they, gone yeah it's not like <laughs> they done. did you know it's like they say in that show they they, they didn't dislike him they loved him but yeah. he's gone now yeah. and they they didn't have the imagination or the or the the mental like well there was no religion. wiring no there was, well also like there was just no mental wiring the the idea of treating you know, even even someone who's not religious has that in, that instinct now. Well, I think but they it, also... it's a fascinating way of the, the way the brain develops, and if they can somehow reflect that idea in this game, I think that will be a kind of a an achievement. Well, I think also back then, I don't think that we looked at ourselves different from animals. That's true too. And so you watch an animal die; it just stays where it died, mm -hmm. and it decays, and then it's gone. And so, if you look at it from that perspective, it makes sense that if a sapien or whatever time period we're talking about passes away, they just stay there because mm. to them they're it's just like an animal anyway. My big question is how do you think they transition through such big periods of time? Because look, this is an open world action adventure survival game. And it's it, with that genre, it's something that you're constantly building, right? Mm. And you're building up your levels and blah blah blah. How do you make that leap from <laughs> 10 million years ago to 8 million years, until at the end you get to 2 million years well, ago. Well, I figure you're probably upgrading until the point where, like, you sort of finish the, you know, you finish the homo habilis section of the game. You think that's going to be clearly delineated like that? It's just going to be like, here's this section, here's this Maybe. section? I mean, I That can, seems odd for modern day. I can think of, like, two ways. I mean, one way would be the spore sort of model, where you, quote-unquote, evolve enough, and then you can jump to the next level if you want. Uh, the other is, uh, we know from Assassin's Creed, Patrice is not afraid to time jump. No, you're right. Um, so, it could just be, you know, if, if the, the idea is to tell the story of, you know, us, it could just be like, you know, flash it, like little, almost little short story chapters uh, jumping through history. But with Assassin's Creed, you had a set of characters that made all those jumps through time. Mm -hmm. You had a continuity with the cast, despite the different time yeah. periods. Unless this is another Assassin's Creed that has some crazy, no, like, so. which I don't either. How do you do that? I mean, you, you build this relationship between the player and the character for a period of time. And then, obviously, that character doesn't live to be mm -hmm. 10 million years old. It just seems like uh, well, I think the Patrice idea... just kind of put himself behind the eight ball with the concept of the game well, from the beginning. I don't know if I agree with that, because uh, if you frame it right... By definition, you're in you're involved or interested because it's us, it's 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 the story of us. Yeah. It's kind of like the framing a device I would use for something like that. Is is well, this, the logo for the game you know, this is, is the evolution, right? It shows, and like, it's like this. I mean, this is your great 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 whatever. You know, like this is this is the story of how we got here, and like that's kind of a, a kind of also the framing device that was used for like the any like BBC documentary about this kind of time period. Yeah, uh, you'll get that too. And I feel like you can tell you can tell interesting stories with the you know little vignettes uh, that then that are satisfying little short stories, but then kind of you know once you see them all, kind of build this bigger picture of like oh this is what it was like. This is this is sort of the progression. 
through <laughs> through this time period that really we don't know. You know, pre it's prehistory. It's no fuzzy, one, no yeah. one could write yeah. anything down. We have handprints, but like, you know, it's it's uh, it's piecing the puzzle together. Do you think it was smart for him to make this game? I mean, one thing I could tell. I mean, do I think it's going to be like make him rich? No. Well, Probably he already not. is rich. But like, that's my what my point was that you know he's rich because he decided to make this game because. I guarantee there's been more than a dozen people that have told him, that's probably not a really good idea. Hmm. I mean, you never know what's going to catch. I mean, Primal sold okay. Um, Primal sold on the back of being Far Cry. This is going right. to have to sell on the back of basically being an art project. I mean, most um, people don't know who Patrice is. No, but I, if, if it becomes an interesting, like, if it's an interesting idea, if it's a concept that grabs one's attention, because the other thing you notice, like, uh, that I like in that, in that logo is there's two more dots after the, right. the er fully erect human. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, what's that about? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so who knows if there's going to be some weird sci-fi twist in here, but it looks so far that they're basically trying to make uh, a pretty straightforward historical game. And I think its strength is probably that like there's nothing else like it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. So Yeah. Um, and it's certainly, I mean, a game like this I would normally expect to be like some kind of like C or B list Japanese game that would only be available right. digitally, right, like, right. like a Tokyo Jungle kind of thing, yeah, yeah. which is full of jank and sort of like that whole like, oh, well, I mean, you know, Patrice is not going to release a no, game. not at all. So this, <laughs> you know, this looks like a super high production value is going to be you know, with Patrice. It's going to be that. Well, they're already working on it for two plus years, so so maybe it is a bit of a vanity project, but at least it's an interesting one. Yeah, I think our industry needs more stuff like this, to be honest, mm -hmm. because you don't know how the audience is going to react until you give them the opportunity to react. And with everyone playing it safe with the budgets of games today, I admire Patrice for taking sort of his own fortune that he built working on Assassin's Creed and putting it into something that most people will probably consider art. I think when you when you talk about is is art is something art or is it not art? I think there's a certain element of that discussion that relates to trailblazing and doing something that's never been done before and seeing things differently and doing things differently. And uh, I feel like that's kind of what we're getting with Ancestors. It's a, it, it takes a lot of balls to make a game like Ancestors, I guess is what I'm trying to say, for mm -hmm. a number of reasons. And Patrice is a smart guy who worked in the big budget game development business. He knows. You know, nobody had to tell him, hey, this is really risky. Uh, so I really admire him for investing his own money, putting his own money where his mouth is, and trying to make something different and special. So I'm guessing we'll get another look at this game around E3. That's mm -hmm. my best guess. Um, Panache Studios is the name of his studio. That's is he putting us. it out himself, or is there a publisher? Right yeah. now there's no publisher. I would not be surprised if Ubisoft... <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I would not be surprised if Ubisoft picks this up as maybe a little pet project. I mean, we've seen Ubisoft promote and put out worse. I mean, remember, it closed its E3 press conference last year with Steep. Right. So, and that did great. <laughs> yeah, the gangbusters. So, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they reunite. They know each other already. Uh, Ubisoft is open to ideas like this. Patrice has made them a lot of money. Yep, and Ubisoft made him a lot of money too. So yeah. it's a symbiotic relationship there. But uh, I'm just always glad to see unique ideas, uh, people taking risks, and trying something different from what everyone else is trying. Uh, they don't always work. I think uh, everything is probably a good example of that. Like, very polarizing game. Mm. Uh, some people think it's the best thing ever. Some people are like, that's not a game. And it, in fact, does play itself. <laughs> it can play itself. That's true. Yeah, so, I do enjoy it. I, right. I still, have, I still play that here and there. We need games like that to... Maybe this game isn't, isn't a success. But maybe there's an element in it that other developers see. And they're like, oh, wow. And then we see it in the next Horizon the sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn, or and it, it I, becomes I just, kind of this next thing. There's just like my instinct tells me there's some kind of sporish thing happening here, where basically well, they show the first shot is of basically a right. cell. But basically, what I'm saying is like you know, if it's an action adventure kind of thing, I feel like you're probably passing on particular particular traits that like would be equivalent of skills or whatever you you acquire, and like you can kind of build your ancestor into what you want them. To, you know, so you're still. You're, you're carrying some kind of gameplay continuity on to the next, like, leap, you know. And who knows how far it goes if you're actually playing through, you know, generations of the same thing until you get, you know, may, maybe, like, what you end up with at two million years won't re remotely resemble what actually was around two million years ago. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe you'll be able to impact the ecosystem or your own characters to the point that, like, you can 
make a primate that's a totally different creature. I think my biggest concern is that how interesting is it to spend five hours learning how to make a fire? Mm. <laughs> like, and then you get to the point where they're learning how to make the wheel. It's just not... Oh, wheels came way later than that. Yeah, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, like you're you're not looking at a lot of technology in this. If you're going to go with two million years, you're looking at maybe fire and maybe some pointy things and some it's some some hammer, some rock axes, right. hand axes, St stone tools. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the, the maybe part of the thing is like you know you're obviously going to be dealing with tribes or, or family groups of, of some kind because that's how you know social primates have always lived. So maybe they're going to make you care about your family, and part of the survival aspect is going to make make sure they can they all survive. Well, maybe they, maybe it'll just... really suck when one of your family members gets killed. Maybe that'll impact how the tribe can behave, and everybody has a, like a, like a function in the tribe, and and like it makes the game har harder because you failed to protect that one. Maybe we just figured out also how they're going to tackle the multiple time periods in such a big stretch mm -hmm. of time. Is that the game is called Ancestors, mm -hmm. so. Maybe it is all about that one family of apes that mm -hmm. evolves over time, and certain matriarchs and patriarchs die, but then they have kids, and then they become the matriarch mm -hmm. and the patriarch, and on and on and on, until you get to the end of the game. Mm -hmm. I love it when we figure out things well, we, on our own. We think we figure <laughs> well, it out. Well, we think, yeah. I think that's a pretty good guess, maybe. But yeah. uh, always excited to see new ideas in the games industry. We need a lot more games like this. Look, some of these developers are filthy rich, and they can totally afford to do projects like this that could potentially really become a springboard to change the industry going forward for decades to come. So good luck, Patrice. Can't wait to see more. Uh, let's move on. We're going to talk. This is kind of the... Uh, well, we were just talking about how certain ideas come out, and then they foster ideas in other games. This is sort of maybe the worst-case scenario of that happening. Mm. Uh, so this week, Bandai Namco trademarked in Europe Pac-Man Maker. That's so amaze. <laughs> that Ama is. That's amazing. Uh. <laughs> Cheapest pun ever. But and I didn't even do that with the graphic, by the way. It would have been very simple <laughs> to do that. But uh, you th so, first of all, what are your impressions of Mario Maker? I like it. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of interest in making anything in it, yeah. but I did enjoy, you know, just loading up the thing where it just, like, pulled a bunch of levels in you, from the community and, and stuff, and you just played them. I think my biggest gripe with too, it was... Too many it, automatic levels, but... Yeah, that was that's my gripe. So, too many automatic levels, which at first were really cool. And they still are kind of cool to see how people almost create, like, a mousetrap type yeah, contraption. It's just, it's just you spend so long waiting for it to load that yeah. you're like, I'd, I'd like to be able to filter those out if I want to play just, like, a run of actual Mario levels. My problem was that you either get the automatic levels where you do nothing, or you just jump right at the beginning and it takes off, or you just have people creating the most diabolically oh, yeah. difficult levels ever. Like, what I found with the user-created levels in Mario Maker is that where there were no really good Mario levels, at least that I, I thought were good, that had a perfect, like, difficulty curve, just challenging enough to make you want to keep trying it, but not so hard that it was frustrating... It meant with users, it never managed to find that middle ground that Nintendo is great at. That's one of Nintendo's best talents, is that it, it really tunes the difficulty of its games perfectly almost every time. And I, kind of, I feel like with the user-created stuff in Mario Maker, it never found that sweet spot. Mm. And Pac-Man, obviously, is a much more simple game, which is why I think it will not have anywhere near as much traction. Because what do you really do with Pac-Man Pac Maker? A different maze, I right? Guess. I and it's like, haven't there already been every permutation and combination of maze possible in Pac? I mean, there are so many Pac-Man games. Like, I don't know what you would. I mean, unless there's like a twist here, we're not getting. Like, I don't know what. But it's like it's 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 like you could oh you could do it like Pac-Man Championship. Why don't I just play Pac-Man Championship? The one thing I don't feel like I, you know, I've never wished, like, oh, I wish I could play, like, user-made Pac-Man levels. Like, right, I've never said that Because user-made Mario <laughs> levels have had a pretty major existence online, and there's yeah. a lot of cool ideas, and a lot of different things you can do with what Mario can do. But, like, Pac-Man can't do anything. He can go up, down, and left, and right, and he can eat you if you turn blue. That's it. Yeah. Like, so I don't really see where the variety will be here for this, unless I'm just missing something, and maybe it'll be a compilation of, like, every imaginable Pac-Man permutation ever and like they'll be able to do super pac-man and baby pac-man and 
there'll be a pinball field and like Pac-Man Junior. And there'll be, I mean, like, if you want, you know, there'll be a, like a, you know, Pac-Man 256. There'll be a Champion Edition style. If you can do all that stuff, sort of. But like at the same time, like, do I trust like? You know, random internet people to make good maze gameplay? Not really. No, uh-uh. Like, I feel like, I feel like, oddly, I feel like that is a lot harder to make interesting than a Mario level. Because everyone's sort of got an innate sense of how a Mario level should go, but it's harder to understand why a maze works. Is good or bad, yeah. Yeah. I think the other, I think, well, first of all, we should give credit, we shouldn't give Nintendo all the credit for starting this, because RPG Maker's been around for right. ever. I mean, really, that's kind of the first game tool of all but like it's like because uh, it uh, came before minecraft and all yeah the other but games. at the same time it's like the what you call it the um uh, that one guy who made zelda maker and then i think he got it shut down of course and, he and did, changed yeah. it to, to non-zelda right but originally he started it as zelda maker and it's like well anyone could have done that all these years but they did it because super mario maker happened right um and it's just one of those uh, uh, you know super mario maker almost had to be there as like a proof proof of concept yeah. i guess i mean rpg maker i don't think it's even really come to the us very often it usually stays in japan so yeah, i mean you can get almost every major recent permutation on steam on rpg maker and tons of, tons of, tons of stuff goes up on steam for sale rpg maker is great maker. by the way it's good. like it's yeah. amazing what that little app can do like, like if you want to make your own final fantasy 6 you can get pretty close with that you thing, really especially can. modern versions of it but nintendo had the perfect trojan horse for this idea though it had mm-hmm. mario and mario is one of the most recognizable characters anywhere you can go to a, an african tribe and hold up a picture of Mario, and they're like, that's Mario. Maybe Pac-Man, same? Same level? Somewhat. I mean, I think most people in the world know what Pac-Man is. I just don't think... Pac-Man is... is Mario's fun in part because he's done so many things, and he's been in all these games, and you know, everybody's got their favorite Mario game, because even among like the, you know, the 2D platformers, there's a big difference in how they, they all play, and what they all do, and what the levels are. Whereas with Pac-Man, it's like everybody just likes Pac-Man. Yeah. The original Pac-Man, or maybe you like Ms. Pac-Man, because Ms. Pac-Man is better than Pac-Man. Um, True. Uh, especially the sped-up ones you find in bars now. Yeah, yeah. Um, or maybe you like Pac-Man. You know, it's like, it's not like, oh, well, I like Mario 3 because it has the Tanuki stuff, and it's got, you know, you can fly a little bit, and you can do this thing, and, and like it has that the giant land, and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, I like Super Mario 64, because you can run around in all this big world and collect the stars like that, and there's all these, like, 3D puzzles. Well, I, I like uh, Super Mario Wii U, because... You know, you can you know, can run around and like you know, it's 2D and four players can play together. Like, like there's nothing like that in Pac-Man. No. You know, like I mean, the base material here for Pac-Man is so limited yeah. and limiting that I just, I just can't see it. And and look, I'm a big Pac-Man fan. I grew up with Pac-Man. I love Pac-Man 256. I love Pac-Man Championship Edition. But I just don't see creating courses when there are already literally thousands of Pac-Man mazes already created. Mm-hmm. I can't see little Jimmy from Nebraska coming up with some concept that hasn't already been done dozens right. and dozens of times over. Now, and you don't fa- have the tools to do it anyway. The concept is so simple mm-hmm. that I just can't see it being a success. Now, to be fair, uh, just because they registered the trademark doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, could be they, they come to the same conclusion we did. Could be they watch this show and they're like, oh, what are we thinking? <laughs> I like uh, that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're both... Bandai gonna- Bank, 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 Bank Namco is watching, put... Kiryu Kazuma in Tekken 7. Yeah. <laughs> too late for that, too, probably. Well, DLC, I uh, guess. Harada's asking for suggestions oh, on really? Twitter. Yeah. Although I, the, the number one, uh, I think the number one retweeted one was uh, this wrestler girl from uh, uh, that Valhalla cyberpunk uh, bar game. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. I think we're both in agreement, though, that... Pac-Man Maker, probably not the best idea. No, I mean, I'll, I'll allow it the p- potential to surprise me if, if it's more than I'm thinking it is, but I feel like if you're going to hold up level design competition between Pac-Man and Mario, like, Mario's going to crush him. Like, it, it's just, it's a maze. I could think of hundreds of franchises that would be better suited and it's to like, it's like, what is it get? Oh, well, in this maze, the power pellets over here. Yeah. It's like, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're basically talking <laughs> like, about. Like, <laughs> And, like, that's good enough when you change the maze up in, you know, in the individual Pac-Man games, but it's, like, I feel like that's not going to be enough for me to sit through, a, like, a 30-second download for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you remember or not, but when the original Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man were in the arcades, it was about memorizing every yeah. stage. Like, you could buy books 
Oh yeah. That would show the draw the line through the map, showing you exact. If you follow it and you never stop, you'll complete every mm -hmm. one of these. And people you'll never would get touched by a ghost. Yeah, people would read those books and memorize every mm -hmm. freaking stage, and that's mind blowing. And people who would just learn like. Oh, if you if you go to like this corner and you turn this way and then turn back, it'll make the blue ghost do this. Right. And like like yeah. the way the ghosts would would behave and the way they react to Pac-Man's movements and how you could basically steer the ghosts. Yeah, yeah. Based on how you move Pac-Man around. I mean, it's yeah. fascinating. Like, there's some real deep strategy there. Um, but that has nothing to do with Maybe. whether it'd be interested to make another maze and have people <laughs> run through it. Definitely not. All right, let's move along. And he let's... couldn't do automatic levels. Yeah. So no one would care. Yeah, you're right. No one would care. <laughs> Actually, they could. I mean, you could still, yeah. maybe if they allow you to draw his path, now, Sonic and the then draw the path of the ghost. Sonic the Hedgehog Maker. Now you got my attention. Yeah, I mean, that would work. That would work. Certainly. It'd be more complex than Mario Maker. It'd probably end up being better than a lot of the Sonic games true. that Sega releases. That's probably why they don't the, do it. They, yeah, they don't want the fans to show them up. <laughs> All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about a game called Code Vein. So, Bandai Namco... Um, and more specifically, the studio that makes the Souls games has gone on record saying Dark Souls 3 is the last game in the Souls franchise. Uh -huh. uh, just today they released like the complete edition of Dark Souls 3 where you can get the base game and all the DLC for one price in a retail package. Um, tons of interviews leading up to the release of Dark Souls 3. Over and over they kept saying, yes, this is it. This is the final chapter. It's run its course. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get this... I mean, maybe it won't be called Dark Souls. Right. But... Yeah. And uh, so last week... Was it last week? Yeah, I think it was last week they announced that they are going to unveil a new franchise. And then earlier this week they put out a trailer where it was just called like Secret Bandai Namco Project mm. or whatever. And it was... Uh, we have the trailer here. We'll show it here in a second. And it was all just like hand-drawn art. It, you could tell it wasn't the game. It was like concept art or whatever. Um, and then, toward, as the week went on, they finally announced what the game was. It, it is called Code Vein. Um, and it's basically, now that they've announced everything, they put out a bunch of screenshots yesterday, it's basically Dark Souls with vampires. Yeah. <laughs> and, By the God Eater team. Right, yeah. Which is a little strange, I think, maybe. Yeah, I mean, they're not too far off. Yeah. Like, if you play the guy. I mean, they're more Monster Hunter clones. Oh, yeah, way more like, Monster Hunter. It's not a huge leap from there to there. You don't think, though? Because what... Here's the thing. So, this is turning into a genre. It is a genre now. And it, I don't know if I've ever seen a genre created based on something like difficulty. But that's really what it is. That's what separates these games, is that... They're very well balanced, and they're extremely challenging. And because they're very well balanced... And there's bonfires. Yeah, yeah. And because they're very well balanced, people are okay with them being challenge, challenging, because the way they look at it is like, okay, it's, it's me. I need to get good mm. enough to be able to pass through this. It's not the game being unfair. That's sort of the rallying cry you hear from fans of the franchise. So to me, it's bizarre to see a genre essentially be created based on the game, a game's difficulty. But that's essentially what you're getting. The Surge. I don't know. There's a gameplay trailer that came out today for The Surge. And it looks balls to the wall like impossible. Just watching the developers play the game in the trailer is intimidating. It, mm. it intimidated me. I was like, oh. I... Yeah. <laughs> There's one shot where like, like an enemy takes a swipe up here and he ducks. And then they swipe at his feet and he jumps over the sword. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> all deals are off. Like, But isn't it crazy that... It's really not about a name for this. Mm. It could, because, look, they made Bloodborne. And people... It made no difference what the name of the game was. They knew who was making it. They knew what, who was, what publisher was publishing it. And they knew that it was in the vein of those games. <laughs> Pun intended. They knew it was in the vein of those games. And that was enough mm. for, for Bloodborne. I know the great reviews didn't hurt either, but... That was enough to get everyone on board and just shuffle over to the Bloodborne franchise, bloom that IP, and I feel like the same thing's going to happen right here with Code Vein. Could be. Bloodborne had the advantage of being made by the guy who originated the, the, guy. the, the game. Yeah. You know, the, and again, Dark Souls proved that, that the fan base is willing to jump from t title to title as long as you give them the same, you know, the same team, the same director, the same idea. It's, you know, they, they follow that linear path from Demon's Souls to Dark Souls to Bloodborne. Um, this one's going to be a tougher sell, I think, because uh, once you leave the confines of uh, the original team, 
like everybody starts to get skeptical. I even have it on Dark Souls 2, which a lot of people say is the B team. Right. Uh, which is stupid, but you know, <laughs> there's a there's a there's a, a pretty you know the fan base of Dark Souls has a pretty major mad on about Dark Souls 2 for various reasons. Even though I still think it's the best one. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I think they're going to be even more. Harshly, oh, they'll be on guard for sure about this one because you know, for, I mean, we, there's been comparisons drawn to Dark Souls. We don't know how Dark Soulsy it is. Um, well, yeah. they called it. I think the well, first of all, the tagline, as you can see on the screen, there is called "is prepared to dine," right? Instead of "prepare to die." So Bandai Namco, right out of the gate, that's like a trigger word, trigger right. phrase. When Dark Souls and Bloodborne fans see that and they use that hashtag when they debuted mm. it. They're just like, boom, like, oh my gosh. You know, we're reaching the point where there's going to be people who see the Princess Bride and think it's a Dark Souls reference. Right, yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. Because, I mean, how old is that movie? Um, I think that movie is 30 years old this year. Right. So, or maybe next year. Yeah, I mean, most people that are playing games right now have no idea that no. that movie even exists. <laughs> Unless they have good parents. Yeah. Who have shown them the greats. So maybe from another angle, do you think it's okay for Bandai Namco to be drawing these lines? I mean, business-wise, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, you want that fan base to jump over to this other game. But do you think morally it's okay? I don't really see a moral issue here. Really? Even though it's a completely different team developing the game? Well, caveat emptor. That, and you know? a lot of people like, won't realize that it's a different I team. feel like most Dark Souls fans will realize. Oh, sure. Uh... And beyond Dark Souls fans, I don't think it matters. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no one, like, Dark Souls fans are a very specific and very informed group for the most part. They and are. I feel like they know what this is going to be. They know what the score is. They know when Bandai Namco is, is trying to lure them in with a tagline. Um, and it'll be judged on its own merits uh, when the time comes. I'm not too worried about that. I wonder if this game is more approachable, though, than Dark Souls. Dark Souls, mm. very gothic, very dark, very dingy. Vampires are huge with the mass audience. I yeah, mean, not these vampires, though. These are It's a very different take on vampires than I think the Twilight audience is used to. Yeah, I don't know, though. I don't know. I mean, it's a little more medieval, for sure. Well, also, like, people are, like, growing giant mechanical scorpion tails out of their asses. I mean, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> it, there's a lot of stuff going on here that's very anime style. You know, it's more of a Vampire Hunter D kind of yeah. meets uh, the spiral zone. The Vampire Hunter D was very popular. It was probably, I would argue... Yeah, but most the most mainstream anime in America. That's not remotely true. Really? What would you say? Dragon Ball Z. Oh, I don't count that, though. Dragon Ball Z is the most mainstream penetrated anime of the last 15 years. Yeah, I guess it for, is for anime. Boys. I've never looked at it that way, though. When I think of anime, I think of feature-length films, not like weekly no. serial cartoons. Anime is is uh, TV, TV animation for the most part. Yeah. But, okay, so let's talk about a feature-length. Maybe Akira... Um, probably Akira. But I think Vampire Hunter D in America was bigger than Akira. No, it wasn't. Really? Not remotely. I it was big. I mean, uh, 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 I don't know. Box office wise, Akira was a bigger deal. Trust yeah? me. Well, Trust I didn't even me. know any of those movies had been released at the box office. Minor releases, but they didn't make it out. I don't even know. But that. I would say of you know, if you're talking about feature film anime in in the West, I would say uh, Vampire Hunter D is known because you could rent it at Blockbuster. But in terms of like. Stuff that really penetrated, I would say My Neighbor Totoro, Akira, Ghost in the Shell are probably the, the holy trinity. Vampire um, Hunter D, I, I never rented it. I watched it on television. The, somehow, mm -hmm. the, whoever published that in Japan signed some kind of a U.S. distribution thing. I don't remember who distributed that. It was shown it, on it MTV? Was, it was pretty wide. Vampire spread. Hunter was D was shown on spread. MTV. But, like, again, uh, it's, uh, people to this day don't remember that on the same level as Akira, Ghost in the Shell, uh, even Ninja Scroll to some degree. Ninja Scroll was, uh, I think, production IG as well. That was, um, again, one of the main ways you saw those, those sh movies, those anime, back in the day, was by renting them from Blockbuster because your mom thought it was a cartoon. Right. <laughs> thought it was okay for you to watch. Uh, that's also why, how they had uh, Legend of the Over theme. A lot of people had their first hentai experience renting it from Blockbuster. I think they showed a lot of those, and they would break them up into parts on Liquid Television on MTV. Do you remember that old show on MTV? I remember MTV? Liquid Television. I don't remember them running Vampire Hunter D. I had a buddy that worked on Liquid Television, actually. I remember Aeon Flux. Yeah, yeah. And, Aeon Flux uh, with one, too. Which was great. Yeah. Because it was all, like, sexy and whatnot. Weird as hell. Well, I mean, back then, there weren't really cartoons that were sexy. 
Well, there was like the heavy metal movie, and like, but it was very rare. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's you, one you, movie you, you could point well, to. I mean, you had like the Robert Crumb stuff. You had uh, what, Fritz the Cat, like it, Cool World. Like they, I mean, they existed, but they were they were few and far between. Yeah. And this was um, a serialized thing that was happening on MTV, which back then was bigger than God. Yeah, I mean, I it's hard to, I don't know if I ever would had categories categorized Aeon Flux as sexy so much because it was really. I mean, they're cutting their fucking fingers open and eating the bugs that come out of them and stuff. It's a, it's weird, but I don't know if it's particularly. Oh man, like there a was all on. those like lesbian under, undertones to it. Like. Yeah, but it was weird. It was like gross and creepy and in this weird sort of like def- yeah, it was it had that weird art style or like. Their tongues would wrap around each other and stuff, and then yeah. like one of them would like cut their eyeball open, and like grasshoppers would come out. I mean, it was it was so strange. It was, and like, yeah. and uh, I mean, it was captivating. But I, like, it, it was one of those things where I'm just like, I probably shouldn't be watching this. Yeah, at my those, age, that's why I liked it. That's why I said it was sexy. I remember there was one episode where. They had handcuffed a girl to a handrail, and, like, everyone else left, but then the girl came back, and, like, it turned into this, like, and I was young. I was like, whoa, hey, like, what's going on here? I mean, back in the 80s, you didn't see stuff like that on TV. Mm. Like, you just didn't. Like, they didn't talk about... Is that where Beavis and Butthead came from, too? Yeah. Liquid Television? Was that that, or was that... Maybe? I mean, Frog Baseball was the short that started that, but I feel like... No, I think you're right. I think it was on Liquid Television. Yeah. I think that's where they gave it sort of its first shot, and then... Everyone couldn't wait to see that, that they ended up giving it its own show, mm-hmm. uh, which the show was a waste of time, like, other than, like, the bits. It's like yeah. showing the music videos. I'm like, I don't want to see the music video. Just, oh, I just no, that's what everybody likes, though. Head, really. That's the funny, like, they've released, you know, I think recently they released a Blu-ray of the whole series, or, or a DVD at least, the whole series. And nobody cared because it doesn't have the. Everybody loved the music videos. It was like it was like early because really? it was like early Mystery Science Theater yeah. with the music videos of the time I with guess. them babbling about it. And you can't do that because of the licensing issues. Now. Right, right. Um, but I will say, uh, Beavis and Butthead gave us Daria. So. Yep, that's true. Yeah, I forgot about that. She was like a spinoff from yeah, that show. She was, she was part. Of, went to their school like first season. And yep. then, and then moved away and and had a way better show. Yeah, I don't know about that. Beavis and Butthead was always hit or miss. I think. The good was really good, and the bad was really bad. Yeah, I can't. I don't remember much about it though. I can't remember many jokes from it, no. so maybe it wasn't that good then. <laughs> but I can't remember a single joke, and I watched probably every episode that ever came out. So anyway, back to Code Vein. <laughs> Do you think that that yeah, was a one hell of a tangent? It really was, and we rarely <laughs> go off on tangents like that, but we did there. Um, let's go back to Code Vein. You don't think that the Souls fans, are, even though it's made by the God Eater team, are just going to jump right on this? No, I think they're going to be skeptical until it's proven that it's not another Lords of the Fallen. Yeah. But Assuming Lords of the Fallen e- build to be sort of a Dark Souls Oh, Lords of the Fallen was, is, is, a, is a poor Xerox of, of Dark Souls. <laughs> I didn't absolutely. know that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. It's, 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 I mean, it's not like incompetently made, but it's like, a, it's like I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, I guess it's like... Diet Coke to to like Dark Souls is Coke. It's like yeah, I mean if that's what you like, sure, but it doesn't taste the same. Do you think the burnout quotient for this subgenre will be higher than maybe for a lot of other styles of games? I think it depends on on what people are willing to play and tolerate. Like if you're you know I I feel like it's not just that people who love Dark Souls like the format that it uses. I think they like the quality and the and the the and the ideas behind it and the lore they build up behind it and the story it tells in a weird sort of oblique way, you know, even Bloodborne does that. Um, the boss encounter designs. I mean, you know, arguments rage back and forth as to which you know, which games have of, of the series itself have the best bosses or the worst boss right. encounters or this is this, this is better than that. That's one thing that it's God very Eater much, team should be really good at, though, by the way. Somewhat. Because but, God Eater pretty much is just boss rush. Like, mm-hmm. you, you're just fighting massive creatures in a line over and over yeah, with so, your friends. So the real, you know, critical eye may be turned to how do you get from boss to boss. Because yeah. you know, the, 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 the areas you traverse in Dark Souls are as important as the bosses no, to you're right. people. And the rank and file enemies. I mean, that's what yeah. takes the bulk of your time playing yeah. these and, games. And I mean, you know, the, the enemies in most Dark Souls games are not particularly bright. You can run past most of them. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, need to, if you need to rush the boss, you can. But if you want to fight the enemies, like the fighting of the enemies needs to be interesting as well. Um, you know, every, each t- enemy type tends to have a different approach you need to take. If you mix, you know, mixing one enemy type with another enemy type changes things completely in those games. 
And if they can get that, I mean, I think that's what the fan base is going to be looking at, is, is, is whether this game, if it is indeed a Dark Souls-style game to that degree, is it hitting that balance? Is it hitting that game design pinnacle that Souls, you know, well, it doesn't hit it every time. It kind of, you know, it, it bounces up and down near there. Yeah. And so I, th- I think, especially based on, you know, the reaction to Lords of the Fallen, if... Uh, if this game is not up to Dark Souls quality, if it's not up to snuff in that regard, the fan base will call it out. Which I think it will. And it will be. Maybe, maybe. not. Maybe. I mean, there's a certain... I don't think it's going to be a bad game. There's a certain... Bandai Namco's got pretty there's good. There's a certain something-something that Miyazaki brings to oh, yeah. these games. He's got special sauce, for sure. That uh, if it's not replicated or if there's not something to kind of stand in for it, I feel like... You know, the, the code vein could fall flat. Do we even know that he's not a part of the development team for this? No, but I feel like they would have mentioned that. Yeah, probably. But I, I mean, even I mean, if he's, he's got just, his own team, he's got his own thing to do. Even if they give him a build every four months, they're like, hey, play this section well, of the game. It and, would be silly not to try to get his opinion right. on it, for sure. Yeah, but, but I, I don't feel know like how they much at least should, have some kind of input from him on it. Maybe. So. I don't know how much he can salvage if it's just going in the wrong direction. In a, That's true. In a, in a subtle kind of like, you know, to some degree, sometimes you, you get a feedback on, you, you're trying to get feedback on something, and part of it's just like, well, I mean, I would have just done it differently from day one. Right. Yeah. And there's no, there's <laughs> yeah. nothing I can really do to solve your problem, yeah. but, you know, buckle up. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, we'll. I mean, we'll see. I would. One would hope that these guys have studied why those other games worked and are going to try to bring that in. But we'll see. You know, it, it. It may not be. You know, there may be a little more character action to this game. You know, maybe a little more bayonetta to this game. Yeah. And the, just judging from the look of it and the art style they're going for, um, it's not really tagging the same place. I and wish I, the game looked like the art trailer. <laughs> Instead yeah, it, of it what it ultimately really cool. ended up looking like. I was kind of hoping it would be a little more Castlevania-esque. Yeah. Because um, the Dark Souls games are kind of the modern-day Castlevania. In yeah, a lot for of, sure. There's a game that would work as a Super Mario Maker thing. You're right. That's like a good a point. Castlevania, Castlevania Maker. Castlevania would be awesome. We'll never see because Konami doesn't give a shit. No, instead Konami is shoving all its characters into Bomber Super Man. Bomberman R. <laughs> I, think, I actually think that's Nintendo. I think Nintendo, really? Because well, Nintendo commissioned that game. So I bet they're, be like, they're being like, put all these classic Nintendo things in it. How long until, like, Snake is in the Bomberman game? Oh, I'm sure that's, like, the next round. <laughs> yeah. It's Snake. We have a Kojima rundown. We'll have a, we'll have a Snake and a, and a Zone of the Enders uh, mech suit. Yeah, yeah. And, um... What I got left? We have a Snatcher, maybe? <laughs> or, like, a Police Knot mech? I don't yeah. Know. Like, go real deep. It's really insane what's happened to Konami. It really is. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing... We'll a cardboard pro- box. That'll be it. That'll yeah, be yeah. A, a bomber cardboard box. Yeah. Bomber man cardboard box. I'm guessing we'll probably get a look, first look at gameplay at this game next week. Mm-hmm. If we don't, then I don't think you'll see it again until E3. But uh, usually that's how it works. You get teaser trailer, project, code name, whatever. Then Famitsu mm-hmm. runs its first story with screenshots, and you get the screenshots. Then the following week, you generally get the first gameplay trailer that'll show in-game stuff. So... We'll discuss it more when we know more, but for now, that's Code Vein. Let's move along. We're going to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy from Telltale. Editorial today written by Waypoint, um, where they discuss how they believe that Telltale's aging engine is drastically holding back the entire portfolio of its games. Mm -hmm. Um, I really thought I was going to get time to get to this this week. I did not, but luckily you did. I'm assuming you finished the whole thing. Uh, Yeah. So it's like 90 minutes. Uh, Full disclosure, we're both fans of Guardian of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. We both enjoy the film a lot. We're both really excited for the sequel. When does the new film come out, actually? Uh, May 5th. I know some people went to see it last night. I guess it was a premiere. May 4th or 5th? Yeah, May 5th. Yeah, I saw some people on Facebook saying they had just seen it, and they said it was amazing. So Yeah, so well, it's the highest focused, in focused audience testing, it's the highest rated Marvel movie ever. Wow. So I mean, I thought 100. the last one was amazing, like one of the best Marvel movies ever, so it mm-hmm. makes sense to me. Um, let's talk about the video game, though. First of all, do you agree with that? Do you feel like the engine, because I felt like, just based on trailers and screenshots that I've seen of Guardians of the Galaxy, it looked a little better to me than Telltale's other stuff. But now that you've played it... Uh, Fidel, I mean, just like a screenshot fidelity-wise, it looks fine. Uh, I think its, it's weaknesses are in an animation and timing. Um, like, it's very stiff. The animation's still pretty stiff, especially when it's just Star-Lord walking around uh, in, like, the gameplay sequences. Um, and the main, the main problem, I don't know if this is an engine problem or just 
something that they don't really focus on, but like uh, the long pauses between dialogue lines is a killer in this one, especially because there's, you know, it's, it's kind of it's rapid comedic fire. Timing. Comedic, comedic yeah. Comedy, you know, comedy timing comes down to a, uh, you know, comes to a matter, matter of frames sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and like, it's just not there a lot of the time in this game. Like, sometimes the lines themselves are funny, but in terms of, like, interaction, uh, way too often there's, like, a... It's, someone says a line, there's, like, a beat where their face just goes back to kind of neutral, it cuts to somebody else, and then they say their line, and it's just... It doesn't happen in the... In, you know, and it's not that that crazy to, to have that in, like, a more dramatic thing, because it's just, like, you're waiting for everybody. But you're sort of sitting there waiting for everybody to say their lines, and it's worse in a comedic conversation because it's just not there. And sometimes it kind of depends whether it's like, are you in a cut scene where they've actually managed to kind of cut it up and edit it properly? Or are you in like a real time scene where everybody's sort of taking their turn saying their line and it just doesn't flow right? So you're uh, saying that maybe the franchise itself just wasn't a perfect fit for this template? Uh, the style of, uh, like, the tone doesn't quite work in, in the way they time the dialogue to me. There hasn't really even really done comedy, have they? Um, I mean, I mean other than Max, a, a one-liner here and there. It's Sam and I Max, played, but that was a long time I never ago. played Sam and Max, actually. Sam and Max was, I mean, they had similar timing issues, but it was more like, you know, so did the old games. It was just like you're dealing with more primitive tech. Um... It just, it We're was, still dealing with that primitive right. tech, <laughs> but it just seemed it seemed easier to kind of let it slide in like Batman when it was more of an adventure drama thing where I just sort of bleeped over it because I was just, you know you're just waiting for the story for the lines to come out you're just sort of waiting for it to kind of unfurl right yeah. and in Guardians there's a lot more stuff where it's like you're you know it's not just you're waiting for the scene to unfold like there's punchlines here yeah, and they're yeah. they're kind of falling flat because, like, we're, you know, Rocket said his line, like, a half a second too late. It makes a difference. You know, yeah, for it to be a real, you know, punch as part of punchline, there's a reason that's called Yeah, that. that's why it's called punchline. And, like, line. you know, it's just, it's just not quite there, maybe I'd say about half the time in this game. Um, the story, the story, the premise is pretty interesting. Is it um, canon? Is the story in this going to be canon? No. No. I don't think so. Uh, it, just because of what happens... Well, I mean, it, I guess it could... Uh, there's nothing here that says it couldn't be, I guess. Um, Where does it fall in with the first movie? Yeah, it seems, it, it seems to take place after the first movie, but probably before the second one. Okay. Um, there's uh, Certainly they're a team already. They all live on the ship together. Okay. And they're after Thanos. Um, the thing is, like, the stuff that happens in this episode, um, it... It has a custom-built way that I... I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I could tell you what's going to happen for the rest of the series. Really? Because, the, you know, they have a, there's obviously, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of a, a heist group to some degree. There is a MacGuffin, a, you know, a cosmic object MacGuffin in this. Um, and it's basically a cosmic reset button. No. Uh... And I'm pretty, like, already some pretty big stuff happens at the beginning of this, in this game, in this, this first chapter, uh, to the point that I don't feel comfortable saying what happens. We're going to watch it. Deal. <laughs> oh, no, you're not going to, you're not going to watch this. You're not going to watch what I'm talking about okay. in this. No way. Um, but, like, so I can't really get too far into the, the okay. like, why the story is this way, but it's like... If you know comic books, and you know how cosmic stuff works in Marvel, you will come away from this being like, okay, so the next one, this is going to happen, and then this uh, is going to happen. And basically, you can see that some some very big things occur that change the 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 state the status quo of the cosmic Marvel Cinematic Universe world here. Hmm. And you can see by the end of this chapter how they're going to put it all back the way it was by the end. Gotcha. So. That's discouraging for an is, episodic game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, the journey there will probably still be entertaining. Yeah. But I feel like when you ask me, is it canon? I, I'm going to say that, you know, in the big finale, there's probably a way that they could set it so none of it ever even happened. Oh. So it doesn't matter if it really happened. Uh, you know what I mean? That There's nothing worse than experiencing... A movie or a game, 
And then you get to the end, and they mm-hmm. have some way to press a reset button, so yeah. nothing mattered. Well, it's similar to... I, I hate mean, that. It's like, why did I just waste my time? Well, it's a very, always a very pretty unset... I mean, there's a big thing. That's what, that's what happened with the current Captain America comics, where, um, I don't know if you remember, about a year ago, there was the whole re- revelation that Captain America was a Hydra agent all yeah, the, t- the yeah. whole time. And then it turned out that it was because, oh, it was because the Red Skull had a cosmic cube, and he'd used it to completely rewrite the timeline so that Steve Rogers' parents were Hydra agents... And they, um, you know, and they, and so he was a sleeper agent in this new timeline that he used the Cosmic Cube to create, where in which the Nazis won. Uh, uh, but now they've revealed that Steve Rogers being a hide that the the altered timeline in the in the original normal timeline the Nazis won, and in the altered timeline because the Allies found the Cosmic Cube and changed time so that our our version of history is what happened. Okay. But the trick now is... <laughs> it's way too complicated. So the trick now is uh, the, the Red Skull put, put Steve Rogers in, like, tells him all this and puts him in this special container that makes him unaffected by the Cosmic Cube rewriting of history so the Allies won. So it turns out that, yes, the Cosmic Cube rewrote history so Hydra won so that, that Steve Rogers was a Hydra agent, but... He was always a Hydra agent. He was always bad. Yeah, yeah, he was always a bad guy. So yeah. everybody's like freaking out. They're like, "This is incredibly stupid," because it is. Yeah, and it's Captain an, America was always a bad guy. Yeah, <laughs> and like, and not and the good guy Captain America we've always known was only a good guy because the Allies rewrote history right. with the Cosmic Cube. Yeah, yeah. Originally, I saw he, that. He, I saw a story about that right. this week. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing where it's like there's nothing satisfying about just like you know, using the magic MacGuffin to rewrite everything and be like, oh, it, it's actually this. It's a cheap plot tactic. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, the comic books do that all the time, but I'm paying 25 bucks for the issue, kind of, you know? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's, well, uh, they also have to get an issue out every month where right. where you start to run out of plot. This is just one, this well, is just, just the operas. second film in a franchise, right. like, now, a little I early to now start. That is, well, that is certainly not going to happen in the new Guardians film. Right. But, like, that seems to be where they're going with this, and I, you know, hopefully I'm wrong. But I, you know, the the elements. I think anyone who plays this will see the elements and the events. What happened? What happens in the in this first episode can't stand, can't be allowed to con- to stand. Otherwise, no. it wouldn't make any it wouldn't sense make any with, sense going right, forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, other than that, or or it's a completely separate standalone universe. That Telltale is going to continue to tell stories, and that has nothing to do with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, except it's all exactly identical to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, except for the the things they do in the games. Now, I know the VO delivery is a little stilted because of the game; it has to mm-hmm. pause and let you make a decision before it moves on. But how is the writing in general? I mean, it's more or less fine. Like, uh, there's a lot more personality in Gamora, um, which is you know she didn't have a whole lot of. Yeah, character development. In the yeah. I mean, I would say of the five characters in the movie, she's the one that didn't really get a character arc. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because um, you know, one would debate that. Because her, uh, you know, her character arc really has to come down to confrontation with Thanos. Yeah, um, and you didn't get that really in that movie. Um, maybe she'll get a little more screen time in the new one. Um, you would think. Hopefully. And also you've got her sister out there. Uh, I mean, Nebula, Nebula is involved in this, too. Or at least uh, briefly, uh, she makes a, a phone appearance. Um, so that's all out there and stuff. And there's a lot of talk about kind of deal. Like one of the main thrusts of the story, uh, emotional story arcs in this episode, is setting up the idea that Gamora has to deal with sort of the emotional baggage of having been raised by the greatest tyrant in the universe and her sister hates her because her sister has been brainwashed more efficiently and da-da-da. Whereas everybody else, like like Rocket, uh, wants to leave the team because he's tired of running around saving the universe because he's not particularly altruistic. Um, Groot is Groot. And, you know, Drax... <laughs> Which is all you gotta say. Drax wants to kill Thanos and, and avenge his family. And, you know, the main thrust... You know, the main hook of Drax is his... You know, in the movies is his inability to understand metaphors. And they play with that very well in this. There's, there's some funny stuff with him. Good. Um, and Peter is, uh, you know... he's he, You can play him straight. You can play him sarcastic. You can play him as an asshole. Um, it's interesting... You know, because you know a great character. Yeah, because you know how um, at the end of each uh, episode on the Telltale games, they show you like, oh, you know, you pick this, and this percentage of whoever of players picked the same thing. Right. Like, 
clearly my idea of who Peter Quill is is very similar to everyone oh, else's okay. <laughs> because every single choice I picked was like you and like 90% of, <laughs> of everyone else uh, chose this. Uh, part of it is because a lot of the like the, the five or six choices they choose, the other option is basically you're a horrible person. No. <laughs> and like <laughs> everybody um, likes him though. Nobody yeah, wants nobody him wants him to be, him to be that guy. Yeah. And everybody's you know, there's sort of that element of and the, the 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 theme is there of like you know that they're a family on on this ship and like no one would do like some of the the options here. I'm just like I couldn't say that to Drax. Right, like, no right. one, you can't do that. Like that would be terrible to say that. That's to... what I like about the Telltale games, though, is that it does put you in those positions, and sometimes it's not mm. not quite so obvious. But you, it's like you always, and especially the games that are based on a property that you already know, you're always considering what would this character want me to choose and then you get in this internal conflict of well should i be worried mm-hmm. about what it would want me they would want me to choose in the first place or should i just make my own decision it's uh yeah, that's that's where you start to dive a little deep oh and then of course the uh, the other thing you'll notice is that groot is full grown yeah which you know so it's kind of it's just his own thing i guess because it should be it should be baby groot if it takes place right. after the first movie yeah yeah one thing I am noticing, though... And it definitely doesn't take place after the new movie. Okay. So. One thing I am noticing, though, watching this footage is the facial animation is pretty awful. Yeah. They can I get mean, away with it when it's a talking raccoon or Groot, but... Whatever. Yeah, it's funny. The funny thing is, like, the, the creatures feel a lot better animated than the humanoids. Well, um, it's very... It's a lot easier to yeah. create an animal, even if it's a walking or And rac- also, ra- uh, Rocket probably has the best sound-alike... For the for the movie. Also, wait. The voice, voice actors are stand-ins. They're not the yeah, real not, voice they're actors. They're not the so so. Rocket is actually Nolan North. Um, of course, it doing is. a pretty but good Bradley is Cooper. Is there any game he's not in? There's a few, but Holy he, cow. he probably wouldn't know it's him in this. He really? sounds he sounds very much like Bradley Cooper. I mean, you would. You well, I mean, would, they sound kind of the same already. A little bit, but you you double. I double checked the cast list to see if it was Bradley Cooper and Vin Diesel. Uh, it is not. Um, what about decisions? Were, were you put in any tough decisions where you made a choice and was like, oh man, I regret it? Or Not real. I mean, the, the tough, the only decision, there's only one tough decision and it's really more like one decision makes a lot more sense than the other, but you know because of the type of game Telltale makes, it's going to find a way to screw you over for it. And like, I just find that annoying. It's like, And I can't go into the details because it's just, it's the whole... It spoils the whole crux of what happens in this episode. Got it, got it. But, like, basically it's like, look, in this situation, the correct and smart thing to do is B. But there's characters on your crew that are like, no, A, 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 A. Right. And you're like, no. No, <laughs> B is, like, you're crazy if you want to do A because it's going to come back and bite us. Right. So we want to do B just because you know that's the correct, safe proper thing to do and there's and like at no point does star lord really explain that to anybody like that argument is not made by him in the scenes where you're arguing with the other characters so you know like they're really f- kind of forcing the idea that this is an equal choice because right. it isn't like if you think about it for more than a five like five seconds but i mean that's sort of the nature of the beast with these games so, yeah. so I, you know, I don't hold that against it too much my main thing is um you know, you could have made this a much more uh, a, a much more f- smoother flowing game in terms of like kind of the rapid fire c- comedy dialogue, if you'd used a new engine or edited. Cl- I mean, I don't know what the limitations of the engine are in terms of allowing them. Well, you to can see. I mean, you can look at the objects. I mean, the big problem with it is that it, the engine just can't push a lot of polygons. Everything looks. Yeah, but I'm talking about like the timing of the dialogue, which should, you wouldn't think would be a problem that is engine related, but you never know. Yeah, what it is, and you wouldn't think pushing polygons would be an engine-related issue in 2017 either. But mm-hmm. here we are, for whatever reason. I mean, it runs well, which is more it than should. I can, more than I can say for when Batman came out. Right, that's a good point. Um, I guess the big question I should ask for an episodic game like this is: after playing the first episode, do you want to play the the second episode? Yeah, I'll probably play the second episode just to see how they do it. I Doesn't mean, sound too encouraging, though. And you're a big fan of the property. Yeah, but I'm a big fan of the movie. Like, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the property. Like, it's not. You never read the comics, and I've read the comics that the that they kind of based it on. But like Guardians of the Galaxy, I mean, <coughs> Guardians of the Galaxy was not this this team and this story and this tone until James Gunn got his hands on the movie. Right. I mean, uh, the original Guardians of the Galaxy team was a completely different group of people. 
um, from the late 70s. And in fact, you're going to see a lot of those characters as old members of the Ravager, Ravagers in, this, in the new movie. Oh, okay. So there'll be a little reunion of the original, because Yondu was really one of the only characters in, the, in Guardians 1 that is from the original Actually Guardians team. Actually was from the team. original team. Got it. And of course, he's completely different in the movie. I mean, the, the, guy, the guy in the old comics was a, a tall, lithe, kind of elfin blue archer wearing a loincloth um, with a giant mohawk, red mohawk. I mean, the red mohawk was like a foot and a half tall. Like, oh, wow. and, and it was like a, it was like a fin. It was like a part of his body. Uh-huh. Um, the mohawk in the new movie is taller. You can see in the and so maybe like three movies in, he'll have the It'll correct be size mohawk. To where it's supposed um, to be. But it's a you know, the, there's very little in the Guardians movie that has a lot to do with the old original Guardians of the Galaxy, which is like before I even started reading comics. And then when they brought back kind of the Guardians idea in the Annihilation series and sort of going forward, like I think it was, I think it was Brian Michael Bendis who like did this the the group that was kind of what they based the movie on. But the idea of the of like Star Lord being like a quippy Tony Stark Robert Downey Jr. style character, no, he was more of a, like a dour somber space cop yeah. until the Marvel you know the Marvel comics have pretty much fallen into the in the line of like well whatever the movies do we're going to make everybody be that. So if you pick up a Guardians comic now. They are a quippy, madcap, sarcastic, uh, you know, ragtag Indiana Jones group on a spaceship. But before the the movie hit, it was a very different thing. So I like the movie because I think the movie's characters are interesting, and I like spending yeah. t- just like all the Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff. I go I go not to see their by the numbers plots. I go to spend time with these characters I enjoy. And um, while they did a decent job of capturing some of that in this, I don't think they quite nailed it. Uh, it's they nailed it that enough. That seems to be a keep... common complaint that yeah. they haven't really nailed the vibe of the film. Yeah, well, I mean, they're they're you know, they they did a pretty good job with the script, but uh, they're no James Gunn, I guess. Um, Who would you recommend buy this? Uh, nobody yet. In fact, I wouldn't have bought it if I didn't know you probably want to talk about it on the show. I would have uh. waited till it was all out because <laughs> um, I find it annoying to play an hour and a half of the thing and then I have to wait. We don't even know when the next one's coming out. Yeah, what you end up doing a lot of times is just going, going back, back and, and replaying it anywhere yeah, was... so you remember everything that's going right. on. And that's exactly, yeah. oh, probably I will wait until, you know, all five are out and I'll go back and play the first one again and go all the way through it. How much was the first episode? 22. And, oh, oh no, wow. I, I, I bought the season pass thing. Oh. So it was, 20, it was 25 bucks. It was like however much off on Steam. So it was like 21, 22 bucks. And how long was it? 90 minutes. Almost exactly. Typical. Just that's, like all I mean, of them. That's I mean, they're all what about Telltale that long. is. Yeah, does, have they said yet whatever the next uh, episode's nope. coming? Nothing yet. Looks like they just wanted to get this one out in time for the film's release. Yeah, I think so. And there's, I mean, to be honest, there's not a whole lot going on. And I mean, what you're seeing here is like, this is like the only, the only major like puzzle solving sequence in the whole thing. Um, and then there's a big fight, uh, which is actually pretty good. There's a lot of cool stuff in that. Good um, is like Batman? Batman's fights were pretty cool the way they did them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's similar to how Batman does their, does the fights, but I thought it was more interesting because it was a group. Oh, okay. So when you're in, yeah. when you're in like, group combat, like, you can, you, you know, you're doing, like, you know, Dragon's Lair style, you know, QTE stuff. Yeah. But um, you're not just controlling Star-Lord. You're doing stuff with everybody. So it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, it's for what it is. Yeah. Uh, and it felt, you know, it felt like a pretty decent kind of, oh, everybody's jumping in and doing their stuff. And, like, Drax has a different kind of set of commands he uses. And Gamora uses a different set of kind of command style. You know, it was like, Drax is like, you know, down and X. And, where, like, Gamora is more like move to the side and then hit, an, hit another button and that kind of thing. So it didn't feel like you were, it felt like everybody sort of had their own style a little bit. Even with QTEs. Even with QTEs. It was, it was <laughs> That's a, great. It was a nice little trick. Um, it made me feel like they could probably handle, like, a big Avengers fight. Uh, if they wanted to make, which probably you know, will be which coming, probably will be coming down the pipeline sometime. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me at um, all. So uh, yeah, you had fun with it. I had, I had some fun with it. It's just it's not. If you're looking for something that's going to replicate the movie, that's not there. But it's it's a it's a decent take on the material. All right, and I, I imagine it'll improve because a lot of times the first episode in the Telltale games is not the greatest first impression, but they kind of find their feet as you move. No, forward. You're, you're right. You're absolutely right. I didn't. Uh, Really resonate with the Walking Dead right at first. Mm-hmm. Like it took a couple episodes before I really got into that. So I also, I I don't know about. It. I saw a um, it was a there's an out there's a, a ex, outside Xbox I think list about like you know heartbreaking moments or game part moments in games I'm, we're still not over or something. Yeah. But it was like um, one of the things they mentioned was the end of Walking Dead season one. Uh huh. And they played clips from it, and I remember that being like like a big oh big. Um, was Clementine's voice always that terrible? Yeah, 
Because, like, wow. Yeah, like, it was I, bad. All I could hear was, like, oh, my God, that's all. Like, like, yeah, it's bad. What happened? Like, did, did, did standards go up, or did I, I not? Probably so. Like, <laughs> it's probably a big I part of it. I just don't remember it, her voice sounding like I that. And I, was, I was like, oh, my I God. I always remember it being annoying. It sounds like a, like a grown person trying <laughs> yeah, to do trying, like a, a, a kid. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, it may have been. I mean, you got to realize that was before Telltale yeah. had the money rolling in. I mean, that is the game that really put it on the map. So the budgets for these games I, just, I haven't touched that game probably since you know, yeah. the, the, I played it around the time of, of release or around the time of the Game of the Year stuff. I think that's when I finally finished it was when like, it was bandied around for Game of the Year for yeah. game trailers. I'm like, oh, I guess I better finish this thing. Not for game trailers. What? No. Uh-uh. Oh, well, Spike. T- the, yeah, it was the VGAs. VGAs. Yeah. Uh, Big difference. Yeah. You're not the only one who used to confuse it, though. They're like, oh, didn't you give game... No, no, that was not <laughs> us. That was a TV show that gave that game of the year. Aren't you a TV show? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That would be the next question. I thought you had a TV... Well, we do have a TV show, yeah, but... not that one. It's really complicated, but... but uh, um, I, yeah, so I think I, I play it then, and I don't... I just don't remember the voice being like that. No, so they bad. have improved a lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, then. they've improved everything, except for their graphics engine, yeah. really. I mean, the graphics have gotten better, but... I think Batman and this are definitely better looking from yeah. what came... But they're still not... They're still any, not up to snuff. I mean, the big issue is face. It's like in a game that's story-driven, the facial animation needs to be amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really the glue that holds these games together is the pros and the lines that these people are saying. And when they're not convincing enough, it just it, mm-hmm. it just kind of ruins the whole thing. Yeah, there's a little... I mean, there's like a scene... There's a scene later on in a bar where everybody's having a big party. And it's a little thing... It's a nitpick, I guess, but like everybody's holding their drink, like in their in the cup or the other fancy space cups or whatever, and they're constantly holding them upside down and flipping them around, and like suddenly there's nothing in them anymore, and like or like like there's a scene where where he walks upstairs and like and like you know clearly there's nothing in the cup, and he holds it kind of sideways and upside, and then he gets to the top of the stairs and does like a toast and drinks out of it, and I'm like. I know that's nitpicking, but at the same no, time, that's... there's nothing else to look at other than the animation in this scene, because that's the whole point of this game. And at no point are you trying to convince me that what he's holding is really a cup of liquid in it. And I think that matters. That's a sign of a rush job. That's the type of stuff you get when they're just like, oh, that's good enough. Mm-hmm. Like, did, we need to certify this. We need to get it in and make sure that it passes through everything and it's ready before the film comes out. Because Like, if you're going to have a, a scene in a bar where everybody's drinking, you better convince me that everybody's they're drinking. drinking. Yeah, it's like, well, Telltale... You know, it's received a lot of money to make this game from Marvel and mm. whoever else helped contribute to it. If you don't hit that deadline, I'm sure it's in their contract that they didn't hit the deadline. That you know, they'd lose money or something would happen. So uh, I'm not surprised. I mean, a lot of Telltale games that are based on properties have that kind of stuff in them. Oh, here's the big fight I was talking about. Oh, I told you we didn't. I'm saying it. <laughs> Maybe we should move on before we yeah, see too much of this. You don't want to go too far into that. Yeah. So. It's basically, after talking about this for like 30 minutes, it sounds like every other Telltale game, really. Pretty much. Yeah. And at this point, you could be a third of the way through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead of listening to us. So. You're right, but you don't have to pay any money. No. If you're watching it on Twitch, anyway. So, right, let's move on. Even we're gonna... then, it's cheaper. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I Absolutely. Uh, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about a rumor that's floating around right now. Uh, we don't talk about rumors a lot on Game Face, but this one comes from Eurogamer. And as we just mentioned on last week's episode, Eurogamer, when it comes to hardware, is right on the money every time. It, For whatever reason, it has become like the de facto place to go if you're trying to learn about new hardware. It has the contacts, and they're leaky. Uh, you know, it gave us all the first information about Switch. She gave us the first mm-hmm. information about Xbox Scorpio, first information about PlayStation 4 Pro. Now Eurogamer is saying that an SEN, SNES Mini, or SNES, however you prefer to say it, yeah. is on the way. Um, we always call it the Super Nintendo. Yeah. No one ever, I, the SNES thing is something I never heard until I got into the industry. You're right. I, I didn't either. I always just called it Super Nintendo when I was growing up as a kid. Super um, Nintendo, and some, I think some people I knew called it Super NES. Yeah. But I'd never heard anyone call either system NES or SNES. NES. Yeah, pronoun- yeah, it was always NES. Yeah. Pronouncing it as a word was nev- never a never thing heard for me. Then. Yeah, me either. Um, regardless, how do you feel about this, Matt? Great. Like I, I like the Super Nintendo better. So do so I. I. I'm more excited. I don't. This think one I so- might stand in line for. Yeah, I. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Like I didn't even really care about. I didn't care about the NES Classic Edition until I realized how in demand it was. Mm. As soon as I found out, it's so funny how human psychology works. But 
as soon as I found out that everybody wanted one, then I was like, hmm, maybe I want one. <laughs> it's just funny how that works, but you can't fight it. It's just, FOMO. The way, it's just the way we are, yeah. They were missing out. Yeah, exactly. That's why you can't get a damn bagel in this city. Yeah. <laughs> but with the Super Nintendo, like, oh, I'm all over this, man. Like, the Super Nintendo is my favorite video game console of all time. I know Pac just did an episode where his was the Dreamcast. Mine is the Super Nintendo. Mine is also the Dreamcast. Oh, really? Yeah. Your I'm favorite a, of I'm all a, time? I'm with Pac. I'm an old man. I'm an old man, too, but I the SNES for me, the Super, Super Nintendo might be number two. Super, I mean, Super Nintendo's up there. And I was a Sega fan at the time. Uh, still, I'm a Sega fan, but like you know, and I if I was gonna pick one or the other for a long time, I was like, oh, I want a Genesis, I want a Genesis, I want a Genesis. And my friend Andy got a uh, Super Famicom because his dad uh, worked in Japan and brought one back, like because it, it came out like a year before it came out here. Yeah. And uh, basically, when I played uh, Act Razor, like I was in, like Act the music in Act Razor was one of the most amazing things I'd ever heard in a game. And, uh, and, I, and ActRaiser better be on this thing. If ActRaiser is not on the, C <laughs> the Super Nintendo Mini, no sale. I, uh, for me, the Super Nintendo was the first console that I had where I was basically starting to become an adult. Or at least I, it, I got to the point in my life where everything I experienced, I would ultimately remember. Mm. <laughs> I had gotten past those hazy early years where you only remember like bits and pieces of the best stuff that happened or the worst stuff that happened. And so this was like the first console I had where I was like fully on cognizant of this is a great game, this is a mediocre game, this is a crappy game. Before that, they were just all awesome video games. Yeah, I was never, I didn't have that. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, the NES, I think, definitely was that awakening for me. Yeah, was, I mean, I guess in look, some regards. I mean, honestly, you can only try to land that fucking jet and Top Gun so many times. Yeah, where yeah. You're like, this sucks. Like, this isn't me. This is you. Well, I mean, NES. technically, uh, E.T. E on the Atari 2600 right. taught everybody what an awful video game was. But you know what? I still played it and still, like, finished E.T. Yeah, but that, for me, E.T. was more of a, like, Okay, there's got to be more. I mean, it was one of those things where you're just like, I'm going to keep pushing at this because there's got to be more than this. It was like probably my first encounter with like, wait, someone put this broken thing out. Like, yeah. like you, you figured like, oh, you're just missing something. Well, Pac-Man too on the Atari 2600. Oh, wow. That was, that was, the, that was probably my first eye-opener. Where right. I was like, wow, some of these companies will do anything to make yeah. money. Well, that was like, uh, <laughs> I remember uh, is, uh, when um, in A Christmas Story where... Uh, Ralphie decodes the the thing, and it's just an ad for Ovaltine, right. and he just like that disappointment. Like <laughs> that, I remember like when I first saw that, I thought of Pac Man on the twenty six hundred. It was like it was that that lesson of like, oh no, they're not your friend. They yeah. want your money. Yeah, and like it's not the same quite the same thing because there's a lot more bait and switch in terms of how much money was at stake for Pac Man than the decoder ring probably. Yeah, but um, it's that same lesson of like, oh. Just because the the packaging is bright and neat doesn't mean that they're you know they're playing straight with you. But that was enough to fool me when I was a little kid, just oh, looking what, at the, the packaging pack and the art and like. Oh, yeah, well, the art on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred cartridge was amazing. Oh, they were. Yeah, like I wouldn't mind having like big like murals of art. From you that a, stuff. I think I mentioned before. There's a coffee table book. Really? Um, if you go on Amazon. There's a coffee table book of all that art. I'd like to have like big stuff from it though, like the Space Invaders one. Like I. Love that. I always remember what a lot of those cartridges. Centipedes yeah. was well, awesome. You, well, you had to remember because the only way to know what the hell you're supposed to be looking at. That's what... Like, that was the whole thing. It's like, here's an amazing painting of what you're supposed to imagine when you play a shitty-looking it, it game. It seeded your imagination Basically, for it, what yeah. it was supposed to look like. Totally. So let's talk about the SNES. I believe it's going to happen. You're a gamer. I don't think it's ever been wrong on anything that is reported, they, they, to my I mean, knowledge. Well, I mean, okay. I was going to say they'd be stupid not to do it, but I, that, they'd be stupid to not to blur is like... Right. Nintendo, Nintendo. Or, Nintendo will defy those <laughs> expectations. They'd be stupid not to make enough NES classics to meet demand. It also kind of makes sense now why the NES is wrapping up production. Because I still think it'll be back. I think it will too. Maybe like at the holidays or whatever. Yeah. But I can see if this was Nintendo's plan all along to do the SNES Mini, that probably the same plants that are making the NES Classic are is the that plant that's going to have yeah. to make this next edition. Uh, and I'm far more excited for a Super oh, yeah. Nintendo than the NES, without a doubt. Uh, Matt, the, the NES Classic is something that I might like if I saw one on a shelf. I would probably pick I'd be it like, up. all right, yeah, yeah. sure. Just to have. I don't. I would never open it even. Maybe yeah. Yeah, but like Super <laughs> I just feel like I have it. Super Nintendo though. Like I'll be there day one. Oh, and that. I'll play it. Yeah, I will play it. Like a lot of those NES games just don't age well. Maybe, That's the bottom maybe line. Maybe give us a um, 
controller cords that aren't for like Footlong. elves. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, like I don't know what that elves. was about. <laughs> Matt, if there is one game for you that has to be on this compilation, what is it? I already said Actraiser, but um, beyond that, uh, I, I don't think you can do. I don't think a Super Nintendo collection is. There's mine right there. Was that NHL '94? Okay. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> I know it's never going to happen. Um, it, it, I don't think a Super Nintendo collection is complete without Chrono Trigger. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it'll uh, that might be a tough one to get lined up too, though. Eh, Square's on board. Yeah, probably. Wasn't, so. wasn't, was Square stuff on the first on the NES Classic? Uh, I don't know. I don't own one. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat will let us know if Square was I feel on. Like the wasn't, NES. I thought Final Fantasy One was in was on there or something. I I, I did not memorize the, the list of games on that just because I knew I was never going to need. Yeah, it I never got it. it. So. I knew I, I didn't think I was going to get it. I'd buy one now if I could find one. Um, I mean, Chrono Trigger would have to be on there. Final Fantasy VI would have to be on there. Uh, Contra three, uh, Castlevania four. Yeah, that would be my my um, second game that has to be on there. I've played, I've beaten that game probably fifty or sixty times. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating. Um, I mean, Act Razor, not Act Razor two, uh, Earthbound, um, Mario. I mean, obviously Mario World. And, I think Earthbound will and Zelda one hundred percent be on it because yeah. people have gone through hell and high water just trying to find that game. Yeah. It has uh, to be. And that'll Zelda. be its, its sort of crowning jewel. I mean, I would be. Oh, I would be on board. I mean, again, Final Fantasy VI would be great just to have like a modern, like unblemished version because the the you know the, the iOS version looks like garbage. Yeah. And then they they did a port of the iOS version for PC, which is even more disgusting. So I would like to see like the original graphics come back in a way you know in a form that you can play that isn't the Game Boy Advance. Yeah. Um, Can't you play it on emulators though? Yeah, but that's not the same thing. I mean, I'm happy to give them money for something uh, today. You know, like I think that's what shocked me the most about how popular the NES Classic Edition was is that how easy it is to just play them all for free. Yeah, but there's something to be said about using that controller. You know, yeah. I mean, you can also get like you know duplicate controllers that are probably better. Now, right. I have <laughs> I have a controller from my computer that is a uh, it's like a Super Nintendo. Uh, style style com- controller and it's got more buttons than a super. I mean, it's great. It's great. I mean, I use it for uh, anything that's like a like a like Owl Boy and stuff like that. anything that's like an indie sort of throwback game. I'll yeah. use that for that, and I'll use the Xbox. The Xbox it's your controller. comfort zone. Yeah, I'll use the Elite, the Xbox Elite you controller for modern three D stuff. Your whole life, yeah. you know, it's crazy. It's got analog sticks, so it can be used for other things, but I don't really. Do it's that. like I hate side scrolling games that don't let you use the D pad to like move, and yeah. you have to use, they make you use the analog stick. Like I always hated that about Smash Brothers. So you have to play it with an analog stick. Like it never made any sense to me. I'm like, this is on a 2D plane. I don't need an analog. Uh, the stick. Mega Man X games would need to be in there too. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, man, the library for the Super NES is I mean, picking, just yeah. Picking 30 Super Nintendo games might be harder. Like, they could put out, like, three editions of this thing. Like, literally. And, yeah, it might get a little thin by the third edition, but, man. All the Donkey Kong Country. I mean, I don't like Donkey Kong Country, but, like, you can't leave it out. They're going to have to leave a lot out. Like, there's going to be some tough cuts for this thing. It's, I... F-Zero. Yeah. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. There have been so many, there were so many amazing Super Nintendo games. Like, like we're not getting Mortal Kombat. Yeah, probably not. But uh, that's okay. Contra 3. Yep, there it is. It's like... There's a little uh, um, sentimental part of me that would love to see Gradius 3, because that was one of the first Super Famicom games I played. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think it's like a, it's a, it's one of the biggies. So... Then again, it's Konami, so Konami probably doesn't care. Like, here, take, take whatever you want. Like, we don't care. If it's not Pachinko, we don't need it. <laughs> Matt, do you think that... How do you think Nintendo will change its how it handles this versus the NES Classic yeah. after everything that's happened? Or do you think it'll change at all? It probably won't. Yeah, I don't either. I don't think it'll do anything different. It'll, everybody will get screwed the same way. They won't take pre-orders on it. It'll, everybody will just be waiting in line at Best Buy all night, which means I'll probably never get one. So. What about the price? Do you think they may make it more expensive? Oh, that would be cheap. Like That, that would just be so lame. It, it would cut down demand. Bit. It like, would cut down demand, though, no, make it, it possible maybe to get one. No, it wouldn't. People are paying $200 for these things. 
people like us are paying $200 for it right people now. People like us are the ones that are selling it out. The I problem mean, is that the people like us aren't the ones who went and got it at first. It was the more casual folks who snatched them all up. And now us hardcore folks oh, no, are like... scalpers who snatched them all up. Casual folks. I wouldn't call scalpers casual. I mean, casual gamers maybe, but not casual right. retail scalpers. Right, that's what I'm saying. They're casual gamers. They don't care. that they, they didn't care. If they wanted it, they'd keep it. They wouldn't scalp it. Well, I'm sure they kept one of them, but maybe. then they, they sold off the other 20. You think they... What about Star Fox with that chip? You think they'll have the chip inside the Super well, Nintendo? I mean, it's, I mean, look, memory's cheap at this point, so they, yeah. you, you, you could. You could do it. I mean, they probably course, have to remanufacture them and everything. Of course, let's not forget, um, you know, they figured out pretty quick how to put more games on the NES one. So I wonder if, A, I wonder if the same thing will be true of the Super Nintendo one, and B, I wonder if Nintendo will work harder to try to uh, proof it against that. There'll be a harder, like, security crack. To, to handle, they can't stop. But there's it. no way to stop that, really. I mean, they're never, they're never. Oh, gonna Super stop Metroid! Pirates, you gotta period. have Super Metroid. Yeah, I mean, that should probably be the one of the first ones we named. <laughs> a lot of people think it's the best game ever made. Well, I just didn't. I mean, again, it's like, you know, I think Mario World and Super Metroid and Link to the Past are like not no brainer. No, they're like, given. I mean, they're, so you know they're gonna if be Nintendo good. made it, it's in there. If it's one of their big, big, you know, Donkey Kong Country, almost certainly. Um. I'd love Even to see Tecmo Super Bowl on there. I think Earthbound is a is a no is a no question. Yeah, frankly, it's got to. I it's, mean, if it really wants to move these things, Earthbound will be on it. Earthbound's a good pick, just because of how. And again, that's why I say Final Fantasy VI and and Chrono Trigger. Those things command pretty big secondary they market do. prices. They do, and they're also big games, so it gives you value. It, it helps yeah, sort of push you over the top if you're kind of sitting too. on the fence. It's like, man, I've got Earthbound. i got 30, 40 hours yeah. out of this. Well, I it's, like another... the, it's like the, you know, because Sega, again, Sega's way ahead of them on this stuff, but they did their, their Genesis collections and stuff on Steam. Like, three Fantasy Star games? Yeah. those games All by himself. Ginormous, That's like, yeah. you, you know, I mean, if you can tolerate them right. today. Yeah, yeah. The if first you, couple... If, if you got enough graph paper to get through Fantasy Star 2. Yeah. Because um, you do need graph paper. Oh, you paper. do, yeah. Otherwise, it's not happening. So, I was overjoyed to hear about this. Whereas the NES Classic, I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. I like the little small thing. It's yeah. like a paperweight. I'm all over this. Like, I am really excited for this. Mm -hmm. um, if it ends up being not true, I'll be devastated. There's no way it's not true. Yeah. It, it, it makes it, too much sense. It also, the sources are I would be, the money. I so. would be more skeptical about, like, an N64 classic. Well, Kotaku uh, put out a list today. They said, if they did, I think the title of the article was, if they did an N64 classic, which they will never do, mm -hmm. these are the 30 games I would want on it. And essentially, it got to, like, 25 before... The last five picks were like, like mm, yeah. <laughs> the last game that deserved to be on the list that was was Mischief Makers, and then it just went yeah. down the tubes after well, that. Well, then like the other problem with an N sixty four is you can't include one of the biggest games of all time on it yeah. because GoldenEye is the licensing yeah. is just all to hell. Yep, you're right. And I feel like Nintendo isn't interested enough to go through those hoops. And it could be and an N sixty four classic without GoldenEye is just like why even bother. It would be kind of cool, though, if they put out the N64 one, but it didn't just have stock N64 hardware. It actually had better hardware, like put a Raspberry mm. Pi in it or something, so that it actually, you can play N64 games at a higher resolution, almost like an emulator. Or at a higher frame rate. Yeah, I mean... I, I did get... Uh, that could incentivize I did get the it. remaster of Turok 2 on PC. and I, I mean, I always liked Turok 2 on the N64, but I tell you, playing it on like a solid frame rate, it's another world. Oh, I bet. That I'm game like, was hard as balls back in the day. It was super hard, yeah. <laughs> and it's still pretty tough, but like again, you can save anywhere now. Yeah. Uh, that was the main problem. That was the was problem, it, making it to the save point. It was literal hours between save points. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, like, the frame rate's smooth, so I can shoot a guy in the head. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. before it was sort of like, oh, I'm just going to let it go and yeah. hope, that it goes, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, hope that the frame rate agrees with my controller choice. You know, well, the, I don't know if you remember, but the carts for that originally had a bug, like a terminal bug in them. Yes. And they had to yeah. recall the first run of Turok 2 carts and send them all back in, and then they sent you, like, a new one out and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I remember that. Yep. But uh, I don't know. I think an N64 Mini could totally work. I don't think it would look as cool in, like, a miniature size, though. No. But I mean, I mean, it could work. But the other thing is, like, that's sort of in that weird 
nebulous zone where you you run in a lot of you know, could you get rogue squadron on that could you get you know battle for naboo on that could you give I me mean, there's so many licenses could you, you get the banjo around. games on it yeah who owns probably not you know would who owns san francisco rush 2049 now atari it was made by atari and now who owns atari or does atari remember. still own atari i don't know I don't even know. And then, Does uh, Atari still own Atari? That's, it, Atari's owned, but owned by three separate Ataris at various times. So yeah, you yeah. never know. Yeah, you don't. Uh, yeah, no the banjo like... games probably couldn't happen. Or Conquer. Yeah. Or uh... Conquer might be able to happen. No, no actually, no. Con- the, only, the only stuff. Is... Blast Core. Blast Core is also on Xbox now. Is it? Yeah, oh, r- rare the... replay. Anything, has you're all, right. Anything everything. that's in the rare replay Perfect probably dark. could never be a part of it. Perfect Dark. Yeah. I mean, look, you're cutting out... Jet Force Gemini? A huge chunk of the best of the N64 yeah. library. There. Which is my personal favorite rare game on the N64 is Jet Force Gemini. Yeah. Um, although, good luck trying to go back and play it now. I'm shocked that Rare got the rights to all those games, ultimately. It's... I mean, Nintendo, I to me, like seemed, was very liberal. Yeah, with why did they, they let all that go? I mean, it seems no like it, if I was Nintendo, I would at least want to have kept, like banjo. like, banjo. Yeah, it seemed, like, right up their alley. Well, I mean, the weird thing, too, was after the split, they put out a banjo game on the, the game, game Boy. Boy. Yeah. Game or was Boy it Advance. the GBA? Yeah. The game Boy Advance. Yeah. Which is really Ooh. bizarre. I mean, look, Minecraft comes to Nintendo platforms and... So, there is a little bit of that incestuous thing going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but... When you talk about a game like something like that, like a consumer electronics product, with that baked into it, things get a little dicey. Yeah. So. Although, I mean, I could see Microsoft not being totally against the idea just because it's not the market they're after. I think it wouldn't the, hurt them. A sticking you know? point is that you're relying on Nintendo to make sure that those ROMs are secure. You mm-hmm. don't have control over it anymore. It's like if it's True. loaded onto that hardware... It's out of your hands, and you're, you're counting on... And look, if you're going to count on someone to try to stop piracy, Nintendo's probably a good person to buddy up with, but it's still out of your control and out of your hands, and a lot of companies don't like their IP being in the hands of others and mm-hmm. kind of being all willy-nilly with it. So we'll see. It's still just a rumor for now, but again, it's Eurogamer. I wouldn't be shocked if it is certified as fact within the next couple weeks, and at the very least at E3. Maybe that's what Nintendo's waiting for. That'll be their nice little, like, one last thing, like, at E3 or whatever. It'd be like, look at this. Something everybody wants. Everybody should want, anyway. So, And you'll never get. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You will never see this. Dude, imagine, though, when it comes out. Because of what happened with the NES Classic Edition, how rabid people will yeah. be to get these things. Well, There'll be fist fights and, like, no, knifings. Well, look. And- if there's Someone's going to get shivved at if the there's Toys R Us. one change they make, they should take pre-orders to find out how many they need to make. Yeah. Like, because they didn't take pre-orders right. in the last one. So how do you gauge demand? They're like, we're just going to make this many and Here have fun, kids. Yeah. You know, and this one is going to be like, hey, like you, you're leaving money on the table with this. And I understand there's only so much production you can do with these factories that are running at capacity. But it's like, announce it at E3. Put the pre-order up. See how many people want it. it but it's like, you know, you, that probably won't even help because you see that with, like, Nintendo products all the right. time. It's like, you know, like the, the Fire Emblem uh, limited edition thing that, that went up for the new one that's coming out. Like, uh, that went up and was gone in five seconds on Amazon because, like, they don't make enough of these things. And the only people who know when they go up are the really hardcore Nintendo fans they are going to snatch them all up and... yeah. I mean, look, follow Wario64 on Twitter and hope for the best is basically the only thing you can do if you want these limited edition things. Yep. It'll be a war to get yeah. the SNES And, and mini. the thing is, nothing else from other companies is like that. No, no. Like, you could... or you, I mean, yeah, the, the limited Even the edition... iPhone. Right. Well, also, which like, is probably the most in-demand consumer electronics product in the world. The limited edition There's... stuff from, like, say, at, like, say the, the limited edition of Final, Pe- Persona 5. Like, okay, yeah. that was gone the day it came out. But you could have pre-ordered it up to, like, a week and a half before it came out. Like, right. they, you could still get it. a chance. Yeah. Whereas Nintendo was like, oh, were, were you not up at four in the morning for five minutes when it went up on... Oh, sorry, you're done. Yeah. You're gone. It's never coming back. You never had a chance. And it's like, why? And it's like, even with the iPhone, okay, they're all sold out for their launch allocation. You put in your thing at and Apple, a and they're like, a week later, you. we'll send you one. Yeah. Like, it's, it, will, it will call you and come into the Apple store and get it. It's like, yeah. why can't Nintendo do that? Because <laughs> every, literally every other game publisher doesn't have this problem. I know. It cannot gauge its demand at all. You can it's pre-order terrifying. whatever the hell you want from Square, Microsoft, Sony, whatever, and like, without very, very rare exceptions... 
and it'll be that, and you'll get it. You know, if you're months out, it's like it's. And a, it's, 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 it's I'm not talking about like right. I'm not talking about like a like a week before the game comes out. I'm talking. It was announced at E3, and I, you know, like... You go home that night, you, you can go pre-order home that night, it. Yeah. But it's like, even that, it's like, if you're not on... I think there was a Nintendo thing I wanted uh, last E3, and I didn't get it because I was here. You were there, yeah, you were here, yeah. Like, I was here, and I couldn't <laughs> order it, like, immediately. Yeah. In the instant and it, it was mentioned. It was too late. And it was too yeah. late. It's gone, never came back. And it's like, why don't you want my money? Dude, it'll get dirty with that mini I'm sure. Super Nintendo. Like, it's way like, worse than it was It's just for the so NES. weird. It's like, I would have paid you $100 for this limited thing, but instead, I guess I'll pay you 59 Well, you know the NES so, classics now are going for over 300 on Oh, yeah. And I looked go, at it yet last up. night. I was like, oh, my god. I mean, they were going for... Two to two to three hundred the instant they came out. I saw a couple sold for around six hundred around Christmas time because you hit those people that are Man. desperate for that. That's what the kid wants or what that thing probably wants. costs go. like eight dollars to make. It's nothing if that. I mean, you can build your own with a Raspberry <laughs> Pi with almost no, you know. Oh, man. Okay. It's just nuts. It really is. Come on, Nintendo. Get it together. Get those things cranking through your factories. We all want one. Oh, Cheater Haters says, because the classics are toys. You don't pre-order toys. Yes, I do. (laughs) I have so many toys pre-ordered right now through Amazon and various other stores online. Not even kidding. I pre-ordered some of these things years out. I mean, if you're going to call that a toy, then all video game consoles are toys. Like, yeah. how's that any how's it any different? I don't get it. Yeah, well, I mean, just cuz it plays games he's that are old. Well, he's talking about the categorization of the item, which is like probably well, it would go in the toy section of like a big box store maybe. If what there is? was a sometimes, yeah. Like you don't see this, you'll see the elect- like it would kind of go on like near the board games according to some categories. Or I would see it at Radio Shack. Radio was, Shack always has this. But that's system. basically only if someone wasn't looking at the because it says Nintendo on it is going to go in the electronics right. section. But again, it's like it, you should be able to pre-order anything. You can pre-order cars. Like you, it doesn't actual cars. <laughs> yeah, no, I got to pre-order mine. There shouldn't be anything <laughs> special about an NES classic. I know. We'll see. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna try to have a little bit of faith in Nintendo because it just, has to I, realize how badly it screwed up. Right. Well, I mean, I, I guess they didn't think it was gonna be that popular, but it's like they have no excuse this time. No. None. I mean, None. here's here's a question that I will probably never know the answer to. Did they gauge interest, like their 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 kind of assumed interest on this thing based on sales on the virtual console, but it was way more popular than anything on the virtual console has ever been? Could be. Who knows. Are people more interested in buying like a little object that has them in them rather than than a digital version for five ninety nine? Um, yeah, I think they are. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people like well, having that like, tangible. Well, because it was like, what there's thirty games on that thing. So if you yeah. bought those games on the virtual console, that would be like one hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, so it is a deal it's as a, well. It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. I believe Nintendo will learn from its mistakes this time. I think there will be more. Do I think there will be enough to satisfy demand? No, because I think the demand for this is going to be way higher than it even was for any. I think demand will be high. Also, I, I feel like, I don't know, my, my, my Nintendo pessimism gland is saying they're going to be like, you know, you'll be able to pre-order it however much you want. We're going to, you know, we're going to manufacture it to, to the pre-order standards. So like, we're going to find out what demand is. We're going to, we're going to get you, get your system. $149.99. It's <laughs> <laughs> like I said, they might raise the price because yeah. that'll take away demand and then the supply isn't so constrained. And they're so. potentially about to start trying to sell us those games on the Switch Virtual Console. Right. Maybe and that's why we're not getting the Virtual Console on Switch is because Nintendo just wants to do this crap. Could be. And then again, but then you also run into the problems like 150 bucks for that. If it does include Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI, <laughs> that's almost like a like a like worth it. Yeah, I know. In terms of game time, well, that's what I'm saying. Like people like us would still buy it at a higher price than what it's getting. And Link to the Past. Yeah, I mean that's. Oh, uh, you can go on and on. Yeah. They, look, the funny part is it's well worth 150 dollars if it had like 30 of the best. Yeah. SNES Especially because that's a, if you're looking for like a brand new copy, that's like minimum what you'll pay for most of those. Games oh yeah, for in, just one on the cartridge for sure. So, all right, let's move on to our trailer of the week this week. We had a different trailer of the week slotted in initially, and then today we were saved by the bell when the launch trailer for Outlast 2 was unleashed. Uh, I am really excited for Outlast 2. Feels like we've been waiting for this a long time. I don't think we have, though. I think it was announced about a year ago, something like that. Um, One thing I should mention is they're also releasing a compilation package that has Outlast 1, Outlast 2, and the DLC for the first Outlast, which Mm. which is called Whistleblower, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. So don't be too quick to leap. If you haven't played the first Outlast in the DLC, uh, don't buy Outlast 2 without kind of looking at that other package and see if maybe it's a better deal for you. Uh, Or you can skip Outlast 1 because I didn't find it very interesting. Yeah, it wasn't that great. 
Um, it's just another asylum thing. Whereas it, there's yeah. this, Outlast 2 looks way more interesting. Way more. Um, and Outlast 2 comes out on the 25th, which I think is Tuesday. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So coming out this Tuesday, uh, get questions in now. Here's the launch trailer for Outlast 2. That's it. An abrupt departure for that trailer. Total demonomania, it looks yep. like they're all about some backwoods, redneck, mm. religious cult. And uh, an overhead projector, which yeah, we- <laughs> younger viewers probably don't know what the hell that was. I'm guessing there are people who just watched that trailer <laughs> that saw that overhead projector and was like, what is that? What was that thing with the head and the light? Back when Matt and I were in school, yeah. you used that every day in the classroom, the teacher yeah. did. Little, yeah. little, little clear little overlays, overlays they would project it up onto the, the wall. And yeah. they, they draw on it with a little dry erase marker. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Hand out all the mimeograph things, the purple ink, every just like, like yeah. sniff it. if it was fresh enough, you could sniff it and get high for five seconds. Yeah, you're right. Yep. I remember the photocopies used to smell so good when yep. they roll them out. They'd be like ice cold. Yep. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Anyway, uh, I'm excited for that game. Matt, I think, is a little less excited for it. Uh, one thing I would say is based upon the way they are pricing that package, it looks like it's not an especially long game. Yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Um, so keep that in mind when you go to buy it. It doesn't look like is it's going to be... Is that Outlast Trinity that was called? Yeah. Yeah, it's called Outlast Trinity, which is the compilation that has all three releases in one. Did you one. play Whistleblower? I did not, no. What are you laughing about, Sam? Now someone wants to know if you're an underground... I went from street racer to street fighter now. Well, once you win the race, you got to have the street fight the afterwards fight. <laughs> because they think you cheated. Right, yeah. They won't want to get so, pay me my money, so yeah. I have to fight to get that cash. <laughs> you always show up with mysterious cuts on your hands. Cuts on my hands? <laughs> That's what Killzone said. Yeah. I have cuts on my hands pretty often, but they're from cats. I don't have any cuts on my hands. No. What you talking about with us? <laughs> All right, let's get to some questions here, guys. You got, like, pink, pink on your hands, but that's just because you're very pale. I'm pale and I'm cold. It's yeah, air... it, yeah, I think it's because it's so cold in here. The looks... air conditioning in our studio is, like, subarctic. I yeah. freeze every time I'm in here. It's like and being in a server room. I've actually got the shivers during the show before and had to try and hide it. So, yeah, it's like our the thermostat is, like, all jacked up. We can't get it where it needs to be. Uh, let's see... Uh, score fear. Speaking of spore, what's a game you're super hyped for but disappointed disappointed by? Let's not go with No Man's Sky on this one. <laughs> um, I mean, spore. It's, it's yeah, a it's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. For me, it's black and white. Oh, black and white's a good one. And the reason I was so hyped for it is because my mentor, one of my mentors, <clears throat> Greg Kasavin, mm. told me it was so awesome. Hmm. Like he played it and thought it was awesome. Oh, that was, everybody loved that game. I remember that was, it was the talk of the town when I started working at uh, Tech TV. It was one of the first games I played on the PCs there because I didn't have a PC that could run it. Yeah. And I was like, 
I'm just picking rocks up and moving. I was like, what am I missing? And like, it turned out I was missing nothing. nothing. Yeah, there's nothing to get. (laughs) The best thing, the best part of of, uh, black and white was when you would do something that impressed the cow and the cow would go, like that was it. That was the best part of that whole game. Yeah, Greg um, built me up, like, big time. And he built our whole editorial staff up. We were all, all in. I went home and played it. I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, this may be the first time I disagree with Greg. And I then think- I played it some more. I'm like, this is definitely the first time I disagree <laughs> with Greg. Uh, I think my pick would be um, Too Human. Not Too Human. No, yeah, not, Too Human. Well, no, because no, not Too Human. I'm thinking of... Um, it's the other game that was sort of like... that began with an A... It was like Orson Scott Card worked on it. It was supposed to be part, part one of a trilogy, um, and like uh, like the cover was like kind of orange and yellow and green, and it was like a, a, a humanoid going to go on like this, and it was like oh, supposed- Advent Rising. Advent Rising. That was it. <laughs> uh, I read an article about that. You were in- hyped up about that. I read an article about that in Game Informer that made it, that may sound like the greatest damn thing ever, like the most interesting <laughs> like epic sci-fi story of all time with like x-men powers and and it came out and it was like the matrix game was another big disappointment oh yeah oh man i remember (laughs) we got the review copies of that from doug perry himself leaving e3 like a big stack of them as he handed them to me because i was reviewing it and i I took and he's like and i gave it like a two yeah because it was bad that was a two out of five right yeah Yeah. two out of five and and, that's pretty good and i remember he was just really sad that we gave it a (laughs) i was like i know i really wanted to be good i like the second one better well the matrix it was dude there was nothing better than the matrix when the movie came out the first oh it was i mean it was just mind-blowing and it was like every it was frustrating as a gamer i thought because everybody kept describing oh it's like a video game turned into one like no video game is like this movie (laughs) believe me i play all of them yeah we're waiting for something to do we still haven't got there not quite Yeah, I mean, I could go on and on about disappointing games, but Black and White to me was the one that stood out the most because Greg liked it. And I respected (laughs) Greg and his opinion so much that I was just like, okay. And, like, back then when I worked at uh, GameSpot, like, we didn't get any free games. Like, we would get... We would get... It was so funny. Like, Amir Ajami back then was, like, our previews editor, and now he's in development. also a great guy, by the way. And uh, he would get a stack of, like, eight or ten games, and we couldn't have any of them. They'd take them all and put them in the game library. Hmm. It's like, nope, you guys can't have any. I don't know if it was uh, editorial reasons. They didn't want us getting free games or if they just didn't want us getting free games, period. But we never got any. So I listened to Greg a lot. If I didn't have time to play something myself, I listened to him. He's like, it's awesome. Everybody should get it. I left, went to the GameStop right there on the hill, right in downtown San Francisco, walked in there and bought it and went home. And I was like, oh, my God, what have I just done? I mean, back then... (laughs) Spending $60 to me was, like, life-changing. Like, I was so poor. And so it just really stands out because I made a big sacrifice to buy it. I trusted someone I trusted the utmost about games to buy it. And to me, it was just god-awful. So that's my winner, without a doubt. Hmm. Uh, Let's see what else we got here. Uh, Texture glitch. You use the word janky a lot on this show. What does janky mean to you? Is it just another word for buggy or is it specific for bad animations? It's not, it's an all encompassing term. It's yeah. not for anything specific. Janky is anything that's kind of broken. Mm. I think that's what the definition of janky is for me kind of broken. Yeah, or like, like, you know how you, like, maybe you're getting in an old car. And you're driving it, and there's like a thousand different like weird little rattles, and that panel isn't quite on, and that's what it's like. It's like it works; it's it'll not, get you there. It's not quite right. But you right. can see the seams, and you're waiting <laughs> for it to sort of just sort of fall apart yeah. on you. Like that's and if you really want to, I think a good example of janky for me is like go play Two Worlds, or like. Like the two worlds games, or uh, maybe if you want an example of a game with jank that's fun, that's a good janky game, is um, uh, Divinity Divinity Ego Draconis, uh, which came before Divinity. I think it was Divinity Two. Yeah, Divinity Two Ego Draconis is an action RPG where you can turn into a dragon, and it's like <laughs> it's got that kind of like Euro jank to it, where it's like. 
the run cycle has nothing to do with how fast the character is moving across the landscape yeah. and like you know like the the dodge roll you know when it, you run upstairs they don't actually step yeah, on the stairs yeah and like the dodge roll doesn't really mean <laughs> anything it's just it gets you over here but it doesn't make yeah. you invincible the enemies don't care like yeah. it's it's that it's kind not of, even bugs it's no, just no it's not bugs it's just like it's just poor yeah it's it's like it's the difference between <laughs> like if is it is it like the difference between like a cake like like you know, you see like those like uh, those pictures on like Tumblr or whatever, where it's like, here's the picture of the rest on the recipe like site, and here's the picture of what I, I made. made. Yeah. It's like that. <laughs> it's like the picture on the recipe site is like, like what like Capcom made, yeah. and the picture over here is like what you know, European Eastern European game developer X made, and. They probably both taste pretty good, yeah. but one of them definitely looks like like there was more happening under the hood than the other. Yeah. Uh, J. Reed Vic Seven, you're welcome, and glad to hear that you're healing up okay. Uh, our good buddy Justin Horman, Yakuza's getting a new character. Supposedly, the Witcher franchise is done with Geralt. Which other game series would you like to see put their main character in retirement? Good question, man. Hmm. I feel like we could let Zelda have a game. Really? Yeah. Let Link rest. I, You know what? In Breath of the Wild, I never even felt like it was Link for some reason. Now that I think about mm -hmm. it. I never felt like I was playing as Link in that game. Why would that be? Well, he's 100 years old. <laughs> he's getting up there. Yeah. So. I mean, I wouldn't retire any Nintendo characters because that's what Nintendo games are. It's their mm -hmm. characters. Um Man, I don't know. I I could do without ever seeing another game with Jack from Jack and Daxter in it. <laughs> I, think I feel I like he's my, already kind of retired. Hit his quote. Yeah, I think they already did that. Actually, You're I mean, right. if we're going there, I'll say this: I could, I if if I could remove one game character from reality, it would be Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, yeah, I hate Crash. If, if I, I like if I could not only never see him again, but forget I've ever seen him, that would be that would be my pick. Nathan Drake, actually, for me. I'm done. I feel like that's happening, though. Yeah, I guess Dotty Dog's in the process of doing that, or they're going to let somebody else handle it. But I I never thought Nathan Drake was a great character to begin with. He was just, like, the every guy, which maybe was their whole intent in the first place. Yeah, I think that's the people point. play with him, they can relate to it and feel like they're a part of the game. But, uh, yeah, I, I never thought Nathan Drake was a great character to begin with, and so I would not care if he were gone. In fact, I would be fine if, like, any of the other... Characters became the main character from that franchise. Mm -hmm. Solly, great. Is there anything else? Um, not really. I mean, everything else I can think of with like really long-running protagonists is sort of like integral to. I mean, like you can't have Tomb Raider without Lara Croft. You can't have Hitman without Agent Forty Seven. Yeah. Um, Uncharted, you can. They're proving it right yeah, now. Uncharted, with their you DLC, can do it. You can, you can totally do it without do it. him. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Nathan see. Drake, not as important as Lara Croft. Without a doubt. <laughs> Without a freaking doubt. Um, Nathan Drake never became an icon. Not really. Maybe, and maybe that was the whole intent, I don't know. The, but. I mean, the most iconic thing about him is the half tuck. Yeah, you're... <laughs> the half tuck <laughs> which, shirt. Like, yeah, which spawned like a whole weird like meme thing. <laughs> uh, oh, there was a good one. I just lost it, though. Crap, somebody had a good question. I missed it. Oh, here it is. From Yakov226. Now that the HD versions of Tim's games are done, do you think we will get a sequel that is set in one of the universes of Grim Fandango, Full Throttle, or Day of the Tentacle slash Maniac Mansion? Um, no. Me either. I don't think so either. I wouldn't want to see a Full Throttle sequel. I don't, I don't think there's any need for that. Well, I think he's saying it wouldn't even necessarily be a point-click adventure game. It right. would just be another game set with those characters and in that universe. Yeah. I mean, I... I mean, we tried, they tried that already, didn't they, with uh, the Jack Black game. What was it called again? Jack Black, he was the star of the game. It was an EA game. Oh, um, the, the metal thing? Yeah. Was it that kind of Brutal full throttle, too? Yeah. No, it's, that's not full throttle. It kind of is. No, it's not. There's demons and shit, and yeah, it's rock it's, and roll. It's kind of the same thing. It's but no, it's not. I don't know. I feel like it's got the same vibe. No, <laughs> for one thing, Full Throttle's funny. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Brutal Legend was brutal. I mean, I guess the, <laughs> the art style is vaguely similar, but, like, there's no... Doesn't he ride, like, a chopper in that game, though? Like a magic demon chopper. Yeah. That's... Mo motorcycles are not the defining element of Full Throttle. Uh, well, he was a biker. That's my point. He's a roadie. He was a biker roadie. Well, he rode a bike because that's what they gave him. <laughs> he still rode a bike. <laughs> I could ride a bike. It'd make me a biker. It actually does. If you ride a motorcycle, people consider you a biker. Because it's a subculture. Like a, it takes balls to ride a not motorcycle. If I, if I balls had, and a little stupidity. If I have to save the world and I happen to have to use a motorcycle to do it, I don't become a biker that way. <laughs> okay. I am a man on a bike. We are establishing the rules of what does or does not make someone a biker. And my dad was a biker, by the way. And if you disagree, go to a biker bar. Yeah, my <laughs> dad was a biker. Bike. In fact, when he passed away and I went home, one of the only things I got of his was his colors, which hmm. is the vest that he wore whenever he was a biker back in the 70s. And it was so funny, too. Like, um, this is way, way off on, off on a tangent, but it is kind of a funny story. So... You know, when something like this happens, you go and you find, you want to get all the old pictures and everything because you don't want to lose any of that stuff. And I found a picture of my sister and I. And we weren't twins. We were like a year and a, born a year and a half apart. But there was all these pictures of us where we were wearing these shirts that had the number 13 on them. And like matching. It was like her and I in 13. And then we had one with a blue 13 shirt on. Had no idea what it was. Got the colors home. And I showed the colors to my mom. And my mom was like, oh, the old 13 patch. And I was like, oh, what? 13? What's that? And uh, I'm like, I just saw pictures of Kelly and I with 13 t-shirts on. And she goes, what's the 13th letter of the alphabet? And I like, count it, count it. And I'm like, oh, it's an M. And she goes, what do you think the M stands for? And, I, and they were like hippie bikers. And I was like, marijuana. And she was <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> my parents dressed my sister and I in shirts that denoted <laughs> marijuana when we were like two and three years old. So anyway. Because you were their little buds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> anyway, my dad legitimately was a biker. Uh, he did it for like the entire 70s. So I probably shouldn't have told that story, but I did anyway. Who gives, <laughs> gives a crap? Uh, let's see. Did you find one while I was gabbing on about stuff people, doesn't, people don't care about? Shane, um, have you ever done any underground fighting? <laughs> You're always showing up with mysterious cuts on your hand. Yeah, we did that one already. Yeah, and then, I, uh, I just, I, I just and then someone it. was a kill zone three ten. So they, oh yeah, that time you cut your hand opening a beer. I'm I like, did. Yeah, I was there. He did, in fact, cut it opening a beer. Yeah, literally, the beer almost, bottle shattered in his almost hand. Almost cut my finger off. I'm not even exaggerating. Almost cut my finger off. Although I will say, I have been to a real fight club before in Philadelphia. My buddies and I went to <laughs> say no more. Went to a real <laughs> fight club. I'm not lying, exaggerating. We were at a bar one night, and a guy came up to us and said, Hey, do you guys want to go to Fight Club? And we said yes, and we went. And I'm not going to say any more. But they are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> Rule number one of Fight Club. Don't talk about Fight Club. Uh, let's see. Uh, Deus Zero asks, Do you think there's a chance for an asymmetrical multiplayer game to do well with Friday the 13th coming out? I'm curious about your opinions. I missed that question. I was reading another one. Uh, do you think there's a chance for an asymmetrical multiplayer game to do well? Yes, hell yeah, without a doubt. Um, I think the chances of it will be better if the Switch actually functioned like the Wii U, and you didn't have an either-or mm. scenario, and you had, you know, you could use mm -hmm. the TV and the handheld screen. Well, he's talking about Friday the Thirteenth, uh, oh. in the sense that, like, you know, everybody's not doing the same thing. I mean, I guess sort of like uh, Evolve, I guess. Which did not catch on. Yeah. But had a similar idea. I mean, League of Legends kind of is asymmetrical multiplayer. Yeah, in the sense everybody's got a different role to play, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, that's like probably it. as big as it'll ever get, but it's mm. not, that's not a pure example of what he's talking about, no. though. No. Um, like he's talking about something like, I mean, the general idea of asymmetrical multiplayer seems to be like one player has a really overpowered character and everybody else tries to kill it. Yeah. Which, um, while it can be an interesting idea, doesn't seem to be enough to really spark a fire among kind of the multiplayer uh, audience. So maybe there's other ideas. Maybe there's... Um... I think players don't like being on unequal footing. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem. I don't think people... I don't even think people other than cheaters like being like more powerful than everybody else because 
then it's like a hollow victory. Mm-hmm. It's like, I felt like that way in Evolve. Like, when I played as, like, the creature, like, if I won, I was like, so what? I should win. I'm a huge freaking monster. Like, I never got much satisfaction out of it. And I think that might, that psychological angle of it might be what's keeping people from really resonating with it. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I think with Friday the 13th, because you have that IP that can sort of act as a Trojan horse, people are familiar with that already. They know it's all these teenage campers against Jason. Mm-hmm. And because people have kind of accepted that concept and it's become a part of pop, com- pop culture lexicon, I think it might have a chance. The big issue here is that the game looks like it's a piece of crap. Hmm. The game looks so bad to me. Uh, it's one of those games that you can watch a trailer of it and you can just see it's janky. Mm-hmm. Like, to bring the word back again. I think uh, I'd be interested to see if... Um, uh, what was it? Was it... Uh... Turtle Rock had that game that got canceled years ago. I think it was called The Crossing. Eh, um, sounds vaguely familiar. Which, like, the whole point... It was like a, was like a Half-Life style shooter, but um, it was multiplayer in the sense that all the enemies were played by other players. So, like, you're obviously your, your, you know, your random, you know, NPC guy would have... Well, not an NPC, because you were playing him, but, like, your random enemy guy would have almost... You know, be able to take, like, one or two hits, whereas the player was, like, the player character. Right. But basically, you were never playing against AI. You were always playing against humans trying to... And so, like... That might be, if you could play that with like a group of friends, that might be fun in the sense that like you're, no, nobody's really trying to win. It's more of like you're kind of almost putting on a puppet show for your friend who's the main character kind of thing. Like there could be like something to that in, this, in the same way that um, it seems like in an asymmetrical situation, people are more interested in teaming up against something than uh, competing on it. So maybe, uh, maybe that's the way to go with something like that because that got canceled and no one's really ever tried to do something like that again. Yep. Well, I always found that to be an intriguing idea. I think that those the asymmetrical ideas are some of the best ideas mm-hmm. that I've heard in game design in the last decade, yeah. without a doubt. They also but demo well. They do. Uh, the the issues and like like Zombie U, uh, but the issue seems to come along that people get tired of the caveats of it. They get yeah. tired of the because you know, there are because there are some roles unfair, that people don't like, want to play. It is just yeah. League of Legends is like that too. Like nobody wants to play support. Because you're a support. You're not getting the kills. Like, you succeed if someone else succeeds. Oh, we should also maybe mention the Crazy Heroes of the Storm deal next week. I don't oh, know yeah. Saw, yeah, I saw that where it's like if you log in, I think, starting on the 25th, you get a free mega pack, which is 20 heroes. Yeah. Which is like... That's a big deal. It's like... It's like God, I can't... It's like it's like 150 bucks worth of heroes or something to celebrate the 2.0 yeah. release. But the 2.0 release, by the way, is like here, a huge... I know Heroes of the Storm update. is like not, you know, it's considered kind of a casual... It's the MOBA. knockoff, yeah, yeah, League of Legends, but essentially. But still, it's a, it's a good deal. Maybe just log in, get your free thing, and leave. And leave, <laughs> yeah. Know? And then sell them. Uh, let's see, here's from Shelburne. Uh, what's your take on the story of Loop, the CSGO player with a, with a genetic disorder who was kicked out of a pug in ESEA and went on to add 62k followers in a couple days? Do you, do you know this story, Matt? No. So there's this guy who is really good at Counter-Strike Go, and he plays it all the time, but he has a genetic disorder where slowly his body is starting to fail him, and he's like starting to go blind and he can't see. And uh, he was playing online. And he, he asked somebody a question or something, and they all thought that he was basically just trolling them and that he was playing poorly on purpose, and they kicked him out. And he was streaming while this happens, or while this happened, and even though not a, lot, a lot of people were watching his stream, enough were that they started getting the story out about it. And next thing you know, like literally overnight, he turned into like this sensation. And everyone supported him, and I think he they launched like a Patreon for him or a GoFundMe or something. And he got all kinds of money to help with like his condition. It was a great story. It's one of the best stories I've heard in games in forever. Unfortunately, a lot of times the best stories that you hear start with the worst beginning. And uh, the worst beginning is that there's this disabled player who actually is really good, by the way. I, I left that out. Like he's really good at Counter-Strike. And the worst part is that is is that je- a lot of gamers... And not people in Sifted, like, our community's awesome, but there's a lot of gamers that just always think the worst immediately. Like, they look at something, instead of, like, looking on the bright side of things and saying, well, maybe, they're not, they're never optimistic. They always right. think someone's doing something to get something over on them, it's a scam, like, I just don't understand where all the pessimism comes from. And he tried to explain to them, he's like, look, I have a disorder and I have a problem, and they're like, oh, whatever, you're just 
you're trying to troll us. It's, why is everyone so negative? Why does everyone just assume the worst at first instead of giving anything the benefit of the doubt of the doubt in our culture? I just I can't get it, man. Uh, if you're if you assume the worst, you'll never be disappointed. I guess you'll live a horrible life <laughs> full of strife and yeah, you're already on the grief. internet. So. <laughs> I mean, that's the the internet is the internet likes to anyone on the internet tends to assume the worst. I mean, maybe gamers are more or less than anybody else, but I see that you know you see that in politics, you see it in. TV show discussions, you see it in everything. It's like, you know, or movies. Everyone's like, you know, people discussing movies are like, oh, well, this is all, you know, it's a terrible Hollywood ploy. It's all this Hollywood bullshit. Like, it doesn't matter if the movie's being funded entirely in Brazil. It's a Hollywood, it's a Hollywood film. This, you know, they're ruining it because of Hollywood. They're ruining it because of money. They're ruining it because they want to fool people. They're ruining it because they hate people. They, they, they think we're all dumb. It's, you know, that's, that's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism, basically, against a giant... I guess marketing culture that wants you to believe everything is super cool and we're spending your money on, and it started to kind of leak. It's you know, but I feel like that's... it leaks into interpersonal stuff real easy. But I I don't think that that's true. I think that they look at people that way with negative disdain. I don't think that they look at products that way. Like for instance, like if you want to get big on YouTube, you just sit there and say this is great, this is awesome, this is amazing, this is awesome. That the biggest YouTubers are the most positive people, the people who say everything's great, this game is great, this game that you're excited about, you're right, you should be excited about. Those are the people that succeed. Well, yeah, because they're so rare. Yeah. <laughs> but when, you, when they talk yeah. about a product, that's one thing, but when you talk about people, it's like the other people online, and maybe I should just cord it off to mm. gamers or whatever, although I think I see it more in gamers, they just always think the worst of people. I just don't... That doesn't sound any different to me than, like, when I was would be in either a game or a chat room or whatever, like, back in 1996. Like, it just doesn't seem any different to me than it was then. I didn't say it had changed. I just said, why are pe- Why do people act this way why, online? Why are they this way towards other human beings? Why do they always I, assume the worst? I think you gotta go back to uh, Penny Arcade's greater internet fuckwad theory. Like, internet plus an anonymity equals... You know, unhinged. Well, I got it. I got it too. Like whenever um, we did the show where we, I talked about what happened at game trailers, and I uh, explained everything and what happened, whatever. Like some of the people just assume the absolute worst about me. Like uh, I saw on like NeoGaf, people were like, "Oh, you're trying to act like you're you could have saved them and you were the savior." I'm like, I never said anything like that. Like it's just I just don't understand why. People try to make everyone else look as bad as they possibly can. Like, I just don't get it. Like, I had, I had nothing... When I talked about that whole GT thing, I had nothing but love in my heart for all those people that I worked with and that, that worked for me, with me, beside me, whatever. To see these scumbags, like, spin it around and try to say, oh, you're trying to take advantage. It's like, oh, it makes me so mad. Like... And I'm not the only one that gets it. They do that with everybody. Everyone is a scumbag to, the, to a lot of people online. Everyone's doing something to be evil or mean or get one over on somebody. Like, I don't get it. I hate that about the internet. It's why I stay off of the internet a lot of times, to be perfectly honest with you. It's why I, don't I, think, it's why I haven't been to NeoGAF in literally like three years. I think that's just people. I disagree with that. I don't. I, I just, have more I, faith in humanity than that. I, I, I have faith in humanity's ability to not say it out loud in public. But I think once you get on the internet, people are, don't feel the need to hold back on that, and that's what they think about all the things they no, I completely disagree with that. I think that's a horribly pessimistic outlook on humanity. Pessimism. And I refuse to buy into it. Pessimism and realism are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Well, I, I have more faith in people than that. I don't know why. Right. I mean, look at me, all the crappy stuff that's happened to me in yeah. the last year, and I still, I'm, that's the way, I'm always, I'll always be that way, because I believe it. Like, I believe that there's good in most people more than there's bad. I just do. I've seen it. I don't think those people would do anything, you know, look, really I've seen physically it on bad to you. I mean, look at what happened with, well, no, because they're a bunch of keyboard warrior punks, but... Look at what happened Look, when... There you go, assuming the worst of them. What if they're all, like, giant muscle men Superman? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> Assume the best. <laughs> Is that the best? I don't know. The... <laughs> I don't think that's the best. <laughs> what, a bunch of, like, really buff dudes, like, being pessimistic on NeoGAF? That's not the best case scenario? Come on. That actually might be. <laughs> <laughs> Look, flowing, they... flowing Fabio hair, yeah, blowing yeah. in the wind as they, yeah. as they skeptically tear your character down? Right. Well, I mean, think about when this place got gutted. 
Mm-hmm. And like all the people that jumped up, like, you know, I was doing taxes this week for the company and I had to go back and look through all that stuff. And just to see how many people donated to that cause who weren't even members here, who just saw something bad happened. Oh my gosh. Like I've heard maybe this guy's okay. I'm going to give him a couple dollars. Like I was just blown away mm-hmm. by it. Some people were anonymous that donated like $300 who had nev- never even subscribed. Like, they just showed up, dropped $300, and left. It never came back. But doesn't that also apply to the scenario with the CSGO guy, where, like, all those people jumped up and yeah. hit the Patreon and did that, and you're focusing on, like, the five people in the CSGO match who were dicks to him? That's a good point. That is a good point. Yeah. I mean, even in that scenario you're bringing up as an example, there's way more good people in that scenario than bad. You're right. That's a good point. But I also feel like when things like this happen... The good people mobilize. Yeah. And they show well, up. the other thing is, like, in that thread where people are being dicks about it, the good people probably aren't saying anything because they got nothing to say. It's like, the, it's like that old, what's that old adage? Like, for every negative piece of mail, assume 100 people agree. For every positive piece of mail, assume 1,000 people agree because yeah. people are so less likely to say positive that things. That they like something, yeah. Uh, let's see if we can find a couple more... Uh, Looney on the loose. Love your username. Uh, follow Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Are there any Wii U games you'd like to see ported over to the Switch in an enhanced version? Hmm. Wonderful 101. Yeah. That game deserves more attention than it got. It's a great game. It's weird. It well, looks it weird. Get it. <laughs> and it won't ever happen. No. Um, but that was probably the one game on Wii U that deserved better than it got. Um, I don't know. Tokyo Sessions? F- F- yeah, e? I mean, I feel like that it's fine the way it is. Maybe, like, it'd be nice to see. I don't want to do it, because I have a sealed copy of it. Right. I want it to go up in value. I mean, I guess the, like, it, you know, so it would be, I guess the main reason to want that would be to not have to have your Wii U anymore. Right. So, yeah. you know, port all the stuff that I care about to Switch so I can, like, not bother with the Wii U ever again. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a pretty noble goal, I guess. Um... <laughs> Joe Thor eighty four Eurojank sounds like a genre of EDM. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a an one. offshoot of vaporwave, I believe. You guys are funny, man. Some of the comments you guys leave are really good. Love our peoples. Uh, didn't they make a Daxter only game? They did. Yeah. They also, and they made a Clank only game, and they uh, made a that was from uh, Cheater Hater, another reg, a Ratchet only game. Rick and Morty. People ask me about the Rick and Morty VR game. I have not played that, and I have also never seen an episode of Rick and Morty. Yeah, I was wondering if you might uh, bring that up for uh, the show this week. But I don't know. I don't know that property at all. Even though, like, I, the, what little snippets I've seen of it seem like I probably should. Yeah, me too. Like, I'm like, how? Like, everyone on Facebook that I know who I respect their sense of humor, they're like, they were freaking out that like they streamed like an episode or something last week. Like, the season premiere, I think they just randomly streamed or something. Hmm. And I was like, maybe I should pay attention to this show because everybody I know that's funny watches the show. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Maybe if we can find one more. Uh, here's one from Davo124. Shane, you should grow a mustache for Cinco de yeah. Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> I already kind of have a mustache. I'll just shave off everything else. I'm probably due to just shave everything off anyway. It's been a long time since I've been clean-faced. Uh, w. Matthew asks, what do you think of Cliffy B saying AAA development isn't sustainable? I think he's saying that. Yeah, he is saying that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he believes that. I, I don't even know if he does. I, I think he does. I think he's... He worked in it long enough to know that it's not. I mean, he probably feels it isn't sustainable for how he he had to work in it. I mean, it sounds like a it sounds like a pretty terrible grind overall. I mean, look, he's been cranking on his game now for two True. years or whatever. I think a little bit of it is he feels a little outside the party now because mm-hmm. he's not working in that world anymore. And I think, and I don't think it's just him. I think it's human nature to kind of rebel a little bit when you're not a part of something anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and to say, oh, well, I'm not a part of it, so it's not good anymore. Um, but I mean, people have been saying the same thing about budgets for films for years, and right. that doesn't happen. Yeah. You know? 
I mean, it's it's. I will say this though. I mean, it's getting riskier. There's no it's doubt about risky. it. It's like, gonna be, it's a minefield of, for sure. I mean, the chances of getting your money back on a big budget video game in this day and age, it's the chances get more and more slim with every passing year. So yeah. he's not crazy or off base, um, but I'm sure he would like to have some of the perks that came along with AAA game development again. Sure, but it's like. You know, you're, I, I'm, I see where he's coming from. I just, I just think you know, the, the field will narrow on what AAA games are and who can afford to make them. But I don't think they're going to go away. It's not unsustainable. It's just maybe in the breadth of what he's talking about. It's, it's like not everybody can afford to throw 250 million dollars at a movie budget. But 250 million dollar movies are still going to exist forever and bigger as yeah. inflation continues to make budgets larger. But, you know, it's just every once in a while you're going to run into somebody, you know, the, the word is that that's how much it costs to make and market uh, Ghost in the Shell, which means Ghost in the Shell is going to lose somewhere between 80 and $100 million. Someone's going to lose their company from that. Oh, probably. yeah. So, you know, Not the big uh, studio. Not the big studio, <laughs> no, but that production company is in trouble. Probably done, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, he's not wrong in that sense, but in the sense, if you mean, like, oh, like 10 years from now, there won't be games like Horizon Zero Dawn or Gears of War 4. Like, I don't agree with that. Yeah. There, there will always be the market for the tentpole. No, even, no, even, even if it's not common. I mean, like it or not, most gamers care the most about AAA games. That's yeah. the bottom line. Um, at the end of the day, you have to deliver on the game. And you have to hope that the reviews portray that. Which yeah. I think in the last year, things have got a little murky in that yeah. regard. And maybe but... you can guess like which ones are going to be the... You know, I mean, look... Clearly, we're going to have Grand Theft Auto games to the end of time, because they remain on the top ten for the end to the end right. of time. Yeah. So uh, there's a, there's a still a hunger for that type of game, and somewhere in there, someone's going to crunch the numbers properly to afford to make them. Yep. Here's our last question, and then we're cutting it off um, from Not Cirque. Do you think Switch can bring folks back into console gaming? I showcased a Switch at an event, and millennials were really interested, especially married ones. Is married millennials an oxymoron? I guess they're old enough to be married now. Yeah, well, I mean, millennial starts at 80. That's the, that's the cutoff for really? the millennials. Oh, okay. Around then, oh, yeah. They're, I'd consider millennials kids who are, like, 15 to, like, 21 right now. No, they're, they're basically a new generation. Really? I mean, millennial, <laughs> so it, Gen X stop. We're Gen X. Gen X stops after 1979, 1980. And then Gen Y, though, is after that. That's Millennials. Gen Y is Millennial. Oh, I thought Gen Y was Gen Y. No, Gen Y was just when we didn't have another name for him. And oh. then, then somebody, there was a lot of different That's ones. That's why I'm confused then. I thought Gen Y was in there. No, there were a lot of different names that kept floating around, and Millennial seems to be the one that stuck. Um, I used to know who coined that, but there were a bunch of different names. Because Time Magazine would have a different cover of, like, who are these people again over and over. But Millennials started in, like, 1980 or so and go through... Basically today, I mean, that's log- a wide range. Well, logically, like a new generation started somewhere around 2000, but we don't have a name for them yet because they're like too young, I guess. They haven't. They don't have. See, a- that's what I thought the cutoff was. It was 2000. That's why they're called millennials. Well, no, because they 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 came of age around the turn of millennium is the idea. Of it. Oh, I mean, to me, like if you're talking about like kind of the stereotypical millennial, a arguably doesn't exist because generations are bullshit. But like. Yeah. Um, I think of a millennial, like, if you remember the pre-9-11 world, you're kind of not really a millennial. I mean, it's yeah, like, yeah. like, that's the dividing line, really, is, yeah, is, is like, culturally, what you say, grew yeah. up in, in terms of that culture. Yeah. Uh, and then who, Before you know, and after being terminally fearful of right, terrorism. Right, and, like, and like, mid, you know, mid-teens or, like, you know, high schoolers and younger are technically another generation whose derogatory name we'll come up with when it's time, because that's, because that's what happens is, like, you know, uh, you know, the older generation has to come up with a label for the younger generation so they can talk about them derog- right. in derogatory <laughs> manner. And it's easier when you have a... a Those you know, damn fill in the blank. And, uh, you know, and it's not a coincidence that, you know, the generational thing kind of only goes back to the more or less the beginning of the 20th century. Um, you know, and, uh, in America, yeah, that's kind of where it comes from. And what's the first generation with a name in America? Baby boomers. No. Oh, the... The greatest generation. All oh, right. Well, of course you'd name yourself People that. who fought in World War II. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the greatest generation, and then the silent generation. Oh, they just don't talk much. And then the baby boomers. Oh, look at all these babies everywhere. Yeah. And then you get into Gen X. Oh, we don't even know who these kids are. And then you had Gen Bunch Y, and then, and then millennials. It's just like, oh, look at them. They're, they're so young. They're, they're eternally identified with this 
turn of this, and then like you kind of tie them into Y two K, which was a complete bust, which no yeah. one can, you know ended up being. You know, I, I think. It, I we think should go back just, to the question. Yeah. Which is, can the Switch bring folks back into console gaming, related to millennials? I feel like they never left console gaming. Like, yeah. Who, who, who's not into console gaming? Yeah, I think gaming. the millennials are the console gamers. I mean... To a large degree, yeah. Going by the definition that you just gave, I mean, since 1980, yeah. that's when console gaming really exploded. If you're talking about the kids now who are using their cell phones and Snapchat and yeah, that's all that a, kind that's of stuff. a new generation. We don't have a n- name for if them. You're talking yet. about them, and if you Switch can bring them back, yeah. I don't think so. It's it's very. I mean, even just it's very hard to even get my niece to look at standard games. Yeah, I mean, it's funny though. The thing that actually caught her attention to drag her away from her tablet and stuff has been PC gaming. Yeah. Stuff that can't... You like, She loves Spore. She loves, like, city-building stuff and stuff like that. You would think and she could get that on her phone by you now. You can, but, like, she's like... I'll, she likes them because they don't limit her playtime. Right. You know, she doesn't have to wait for her energy to recharge <laughs> right. or whatever to build more stuff in SimCity. Yeah, or yeah. Like, that's, I get that's that. That's the key, is, like, she's like, oh, they make these games... But without, like, you know, they make games that are like what she likes on her tablet, but with, you know, that actually respect your damn time. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, or like, uh, and, you know, and that's slowly starting to infiltrate into the, the mobile market more and more. I'm starting to see some of the free, free-to-play stuff that it does let you play for an hour or two hours and, like, doesn't let, limit you to, like, five minutes at a time. Uh, you have uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon, uh, which yeah. is up on mobile now, which is literally just the classic Roller Coaster Tycoon game. There's no limits. There's no, you know, it's not a free-to-play model. You pay for it. You can play as long as you want on your phone, and it's great. So I, I think, think that'll slowly come come. I think, if anything, Switch is the last console that they would want to use because what they're going to do is they're going to look at the Switch tablet and be like, I have one of those already. Yeah. yeah. I have it right here in my pocket, or I have it in my backpack. I have an iPad, and I have an iPhone or a Samsung phone. And it's not bent. Yeah. <laughs> and the front isn't shattered. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's just Switch. I don't think there's yeah. really anything that's going to bring a lot of those kids back. Like, console hardcore console gaming is something that you kind of get like right away like either Mm -hmm. you play something and you're like i like what i'm getting from this that i'm not getting from phones and tablets i think i think the thing that will bring younger kids into console gaming is having a parent who likes console gaming yeah who introduces them to that for sure i think that's where the the main thrust of that will be yep you're probably right so that's it cutting it off right there we just hit our three hour mark right on cue uh, thanks for watching, as always, everybody in Europe, everyone all around the world. Always appreciate it when you guys tune in and watch us live. Great questions today, by the way. Uh, great Q&A session in general. Uh, we definitely extended it a little bit this week because we didn't have as many topics. It was a slow week in games, folks, but it'll be picking up real soon. So everyone have an excellent weekend. Game Face is up and out. Yeah.